Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Episodes I Do. We're here with Charles, uh, a.k.a. R.C. Roberts, and today we're going through a very special topic to me, and it is the topic of Jean-Paul Sartre's critique of dialectical reason. Now, we're also going to go over some other things about Sartre, but... Um, we're sticking mostly to the critique right now. Um, Charles, our guest, he uh, is a writer for uh, Sublation Magazine, which is Doug Lane's new project. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna lo- uh, launch on May first, I think. Um, okay, so it's not out yet. Not yet. And then correct me if I pronounce this wrong, but his Substack uh, is Ferrochia Anami anime like anime with an eye um yeah it's okay i i love what does that what does that mean oh it means ferocity of the mind it's latin oh Um, okay it's uh i enjoy correcting people plus i always have to like spell this out if you want me to condescend to your audience i can spell it for them all right well they'll have to show up first (laughs) uh um right so and then uh you're also on you've been on a bunch of different podcasts and i know you have uh i think some video projects too uh just go ahead and tell tell people what they are um let's see well um what podcasts have i been on i've been on movie night extravaganza which is probably the most popular podcast i've ever been on i'll actually be on there on wednesday uh talking about the movie the edge which is my favorite movie and if anybody doesn't like it, yeah, you're uncultured. And that's something on Twitch, right? Uh, yeah, it's on Twitch. It's on YouTube. Um, there's probably some other thing that's on that I couldn't care less about. Okay. Um, then I've been on These Are Bad Movies, which I will never go back to again. There is um, the John Ross Show, which I've been on. Um, I've been on Sabbath Cipher with... Um, Kenzo and Forrest, which is pretty okay. Um, I got to meet Catherine Liu, which is nice. I hope I said her name right. Jesus Christ. Um, as you will learn, as uh, we'll learn in, indelibly here, that uh, I'm bad at pronouncing anything. Yeah. I, I, I write better than I speak. We'll have fun with that today. <laughs> um, well, and then I know me and you know of each other. Well, I guess, first of all, you you had written a piece about anarchists, a little bit of a you consider yourself a cultural critic and yeah. you um, write a uh, lot of polemics. So you have yeah. a, a, a cultural cl- uh, a cultural critic and a polemicist with a bad temper. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wrote a little thing. Um, I think it's called um, it was like fairy tales of polemic on uh, that was that, yeah, it was something. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember. I appreciated that you responded to it without getting pissy. Um, oh, yeah. And I responded I, with an essay too. Right. Was, exactly. Yeah. You, you know. You, you know. And I appreciate that. If you know, I appreciate people who join the ring and joust. I don't <laughs> appreciate people who are off in the stands being upset. Um, although, what's funny is I actually wrote that more as a as a personal jab at somebody who I was having an argument with. Oh, yeah, I figure. Yeah, and I wanted to throw some things in their face. Um, And then, well, and then you were on Varn Vlog, which... Yes, I was uh, on Varn Vlog talking about um, Wilfred Bayon. No, this is before then. um, Oh, yes, that's right. I always forget I've been on there for, for two episodes. Okay, yeah. And then before that, I think we talked about Sartre. Yeah, and the um, and then I had just been on there talking about yes. existentialism. So so um, like the two things happening basically at the same time. Yeah. I was like Right. And and yes, I, I say Sartre in the most prosaic American way. I can't pronounce I can't do the R however you learn. Yeah. So um well, it's better than Sardi. <laughs> oh my god. Or oh, Sardi. Yeah, God. I I, sometimes I avoid pe- talking to people about Jean-Paul Sartre just to avoid trying to hear them pronounce it. Um, but 
yeah, no, I was on Varn Blog talking about, uh, I talked about Sartre, and then you talked about existentialism, and then I went back and talked about Bion. Right, yeah. So we've been uh, corresponding since then, and we both um, are huge fans of Sartre. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was surprised that you had been, um, you had read the Critique of Dialectical Reason, I think you were surprised that I had, and it was yeah. so. I was like, I was like, oh, it's a fellow sufferer. He, <laughs> he made his way through it, trudged through the swamps of jargon, right, and and made it to the end with some enlightenment. But yeah, and people who get paid for this don't even do that. So, I was gonna say one of, the, yeah, I was gonna say speaking of people who don't even do that, um, there are so many different issues I have with discussing Sartre. There's so many different misconceptions. Um, like, for example, I, I know in college, the way that they teach a philosopher is they will take various quotes or they'll have you read specific pages. And then the problem with that is that Sartre centers his whole work on freedom. And freedom is what I call a vessel word where you just project whatever you think that means uh -huh. into the word. And then so, you know, people walk away with, you know, thinking Sartre is one thing, but he's absolutely not. Yeah, there's like, yeah, there's like two ways that a philosophy class tends to be taught. One is like a chronological history of philosophy. And then the other is more like a philosophy of ideas approach where you have representative figures for materialism or utilitarianism or whatever else. Yeah. And yeah, like. Just like you said with that one, Sartre gets introduced specifically for, well, existentialism, but. Right. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's the rock'em sock'em approach. You know, it's characters fight, uh, caricatures fighting caricatures. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, and the other thing is, is a, a lot of people get their, like people outside of academia get their information about philosophers often in a piecemeal way. Sartre is very quotable. So people will quote him without understanding exactly what he's talking about. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't help that usually the main text uh, in a philosophy class they'll teach with is um, existentialism is a humanism. Yes. Um, which he's not the only one that didn't like that because yes. I, don't, I don't like it. Right. I, I, don't, I don't like it either. Um, it was I, a lecture. It wasn't, right. you know, it wasn't even a piece made for uh, written publication. Right. So. Um, in, in fact, um, and I feel like I feel bad for leaving this out. I actually used to write for a uh, website called The Human Front, where I had to discuss some uh, mis misinterpretations of Sartre. And there's a story that after Sartre gave that speech, um, I forget who he's talking to, but he said that the worst part about that speech was that he had to decide between dumbing it down so that people could misinterpret it, but productively <laughs> or keep it, you know, in the, in the kind of more abstract way that he sees it and have them misinterpret it unproductively. So right. um, it's, you know, and, and you know, I, I tend to uh, read things that are complicated and then try to put them in my own words. Um, but I, there, there's just a lot of inaccuracy. Um, one thing that you've probably heard from my various rantings into cyberspace is my disdain for people who say that Sartre believes in free will. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. God. I Which, hate people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's an, that among all the other, like really easy, just like ways to yeah. dismiss existentialism right. and Sartre in general. Right. Um, the other way that existentialism gets taught or Sartre gets taught is with his novels and and plays. Right. And that's that approach isn't necessarily any better than the the, the other one we just talked about. Right. Yeah, it, so, it, it, it isn't because technically a lot of people, including um, the one of Sartre's biographers, uh, Annie Cohen Solo Solo Solo. Um, she thought that the the literature 
um, the fictional, the, the plays and the novels were a way of trying to um, present a very abstract philosophy in a very real way. Right. And perhaps it is. Um, but unfortunately, the problem with that is that, Sar and the problem with that is that Sartre is a good writer. He's not writing Atlas Shrugged, where it's entirely built for an ideology as a vehicle to just support that belief. You have different um, characters that believe different things, and they all approach the, the life within novels and, and, and the plays in different ways. For example, a lot of people don't know this, but in No Exit, a lot of people think that Garcon is the, is the vehicle for Sartre's perspective, but actually it's Inez. Um, Inez is the particular perspective that Sartre takes on relationship to the other and alienation and things like that. And it's so hard to teach that uh, with literature because literature is meant to be related to. And not everyone's going to relate to Inez. Um, and so um, unfortunately, you know, it becomes a problem of interpretation. Um, and it also becomes a problem for misquoting because like they'll quote Garcon who says that you are what you will or is a variation. Yeah. And, he, yeah. Yeah, and he doesn't believe that. He believes what Inez says where she said, You're, you are your life and nothing else. She says nothing about willing yourself. Well, all right. So enough about how other people get Sartre wrong for now. Right, for now. Um, what What do you like about Sartre? Why has he been such an inspiration for you? Um, first off, um, what I like about Sartre the most is actually the fact that he engages in literature. Um, I know a lot of people, that's their charge against existentialism. It's, it's too literary. Hmm. But actually, that's important in my opinion, um, because l literature is, for whatever faults it has, a way for us to make sense of things, to make sense of events, to make sense of our, our feelings towards those events and things like that. And so Sartre takes literature and he, I would say, he kind of translates it into a philosophy. Um, and that's the first thing I like is, you know, the literary nature, the fact that he's willing to accept that um, there are, for example, um, in the, in being a nothing, it's the technical way he goes about talking about this is he says that um, the ontological structure of the world is, is something that transcends all perception. Right. But, but it's, it's uh, infinitely cited. I, I don't think that's the word he used, but infinite. Oh yeah. 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 Like it's, it's the, it's an infinitely sided. There's all sorts of sides and he relates this to perception by pointing out that if I'm looking at something like looking at my hand or looking at my phone, you never see the whole object completely 3d in front of you. You're always turning it to look at the back, look at the right. Front. And, and this, is a, this is one of the, major arguments at the beginning of being in nothingness too right yeah and this is how he he dispels dualism by mm -hmm. saying he, by saying there's no duality there's just a variety of different perspectives on an infinitely cited um, ontology and um so he translates that into literature uh, by the thing that i said before where he has different people have different perspectives of the same events going on um, or like in, uh, and often it cul uh, culminates into conflicts. And so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing I like about Sartre is to me, he strives for unique answers to questions. For example, he has all sorts of influences from Descartes, to Heidegger, to Hegel, to Marx, to Nietzsche, um, so many different influences, but he doesn't use that as a straight jacket where all he does is try to combine them into a different, let's say, school of thought. He uses them, in my opinion, as tools to, to make things make sense or to figure out why they make sense. Um, and it's appreciated because, for example, if you would ask me before I read Sartre about dualism, how to overcome that, I would either have laughed at you, depending on which dualism you're talking about, 
or I would have said, well, you know, um, maybe, you know, maybe it can't be reconciled or, you know, I probably wouldn't have had the best answer, but I would, right. never, I would never have thought to look at it in an ontological manner as a, as a ontology with infinite sides, which makes sense. Um, and so I like his unique answers. And the third and final thing that I like as a polemicist and as a cultural critic is Sartre's tendency to take very abstract concepts and bring them back to the individual perception. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And he, he doesn't center his world. A lot of people get this wrong. He doesn't center things on the individual, but he points out that in order for us to actually understand anything, you have to bring it back, have right. to bring it back to perception. And I appreciate that because that's what I try to do in my writing is I will take the events that are going on where everybody's giving their hot take and their analysis. And I try to bring it back to the individual and discuss, you know, the relationship of the human condition with events going on. It's something, yeah, it's very difficult to do, but it's worth its weight in doing it. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Um, so on that, so we're, focusing on the critique of dialectical reason and not even the whole thing for this episode, because uh, not only is it a two volume work, but I don't even know if we're going to get through the first volume. Right. It, and plus, as far as, you know, I'm, I was pretty slow on my brushing up. I, I had an article and two reviews that I'm, I'm in the process of doing right now. And so, but I only got to about 200 pages in just short of his talk of class struggle. Right. And then, so we are going to be doing other episodes, not only on that, but um, both of us, I know we, uh, we definitely want to go over being in nothingness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, then some of his minor works. Right. And, and I was thinking, you know, his minor, his minor works, like notebooks for an ethics, true things, since I, I think we've talked about this. Um, I do think at some point, um, obviously it's up to you your podcast but um we could also talk about his literature and maybe after we've talked about philosophy so that we can show the connections and uh kind of show how that works out but yeah Sarge's and, and for that one i might i would probably just make it more of an interview yeah. than anything else because actually i don't read literature for the most part um even when i like it and uh Un unacceptable i've never understood why <laughs> No, it's it's okay. It, it's all right. I uh, I was gonna joke and be like, uncultured, get me off this podcast. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, um, I don't know why. Um, I mean, to be fair, I read literature for enjoyment, but um, nowadays I mostly read it to uh, critique it. Yeah, I think I scratched that itch through um, history and biographies. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean. You know, um, I think it was a Minkin who said that uh, uh, no biography is ever true. It's always an exaggeration. And so, you know, it's its own it's a it is its own kind of narrative. It technically is its own kind of literature. So, you know, I, I get it. I understand. Yeah. So I would be yeah, I would definitely be on the interviewer side of that one more than anything else. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I, I know I want to cover Transcendence of the Ego. Uh, I want to yeah. cover his work on the imagination, the yeah. imaginary, which... Um, Transcendence of the Ego is probably one of my favorites to read. Mm -hmm. Jar jargony as it is. Um, I enjoy it because he he does this with all his works, but he has a tendency to, to um, sneak in kind of more... Um, I would call a more literary tone where he has a kind of a more, not a poetic prose, but you know what I mean? Where it's, you know, it goes from jargon to like describing a house, which he does very well. And so, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know what? I, he has a bunch of political writing he, that's yeah. even available in English. And um, yes, I haven't read all of it, but I did read one that made me laugh because people forget that he's a great polemicist. Yeah. And he wrote one where he was answering some charge about um, him being sympathetic to the Soviet Union or something. And um, <laughs> he said something like, um, if the critic wanted to do anybody any good, he should ship himself off to Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
yeah uh so i think actually that all that political stuff that would deserve its own episode as well yes too because yeah he's got you know he wrote a book on cuba he he's got a ton of stuff absolutely and and i'd have to read it all um, or try to at least get acquainted with it that's the thing about sartre is you know a lot you know i've read a lot but there's so much more Oh, it's, man. it's like it's ever expanding or they find like a new manuscript or something and they're like oh yeah but you know he did this and it's like oh no stop it's like, <laughs> well and then there's a lot that's not even in english like right. um yeah. his whole situations yes collection yeah. and yeah who oh, knows yeah. what what he wrote in uh well i'm not gonna i'll save that yeah so um before we kick into gear and start going through the mechanics of critique of dialectical reason i just wanted to give sort of a biographical overview of of sartre uh just really quick for for whoever um so he was born in 1905 i think um going off of memory on that uh yeah and he um lived all the way until 1980 and uh i think you said this that yesterday yes yes yesterday was the 42nd anniversary of his death um which uh i commemorated by spamming everybody with my favorite sartre quotes yeah and and so yeah he he lived a long time in my opinion during some of the most tumultuous um years in europe and he was on both sides of the of world war ii as in the period of time right (laughs) um uh yeah well i mean he was he was in a you know he was a prisoner of war so i mean yeah oh i'll get into that but yeah and he also yeah so i'll just start from just hit some points here so when sartre was a student he studied and earned certificates in psychology and the history of philosophy and logic general philosophy ethics and sociology and physics all of that uh and then Uh, real quick are you referring to like high school quotation marks i know that's not the direct parallel but no, I think this is uh, at what our would be our university level. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Because I, I was gonna, I, I just thought of uh, something that a one of his teachers and I know it's not called high school, but I'm gonna be an American and call it high school. But uh, there's some teacher or something um, who described him uh, or had a nickname for him, called him Blue Beak. Sorry, random story. Yeah, it's because he was apparently, and I quote cantankerous and quarrelsome go ahead sorry and, well yeah so anyway he he eventually got earned what would be his master's degree uh but it's called something else that i won't even try to pronounce in french <laughs> and right. his thesis was um in 1928 image in psycho- psychological life role in nature so really Sartre has all this um, this uh, familiarity with philosophy, uh, but what he actually started teaching was psychology. And yeah. so between 1931 and 1945, he taught at a few different places. Um, and, uh, and that was it, because in 1945, he got drafted. Yes and served his time as a meteorologist right um uh, until he was captured and then spent nine months as a prisoner of war uh when he was a teacher um he apparently almost got in trouble one of one, a lot of the reason he uh moved around was he had a problem following the rules yeah um as a teacher <laughs> because there was a there was a setup where the teacher was supposed to not engage the students as anything other than like their lessers their inferiors oh wow and, and he he used to like you you weren't supposed to go be their friend or anything they weren't supposed to come up to you and ask for oh why is my great you know like how we do now or you yeah well you're great you're you weren't supposed to do that you're supposed to not and 
he used to go go for drinks with them after school he would hang out talk with them um he'd sing um incredibly obscene songs um yeah and he um he also got in trouble because he was he wanted to relate uh, some of his courses to cinema and i forget which school it was but you're not he, you weren't supposed to at that school i don't think it was a wide ranging thing but at that school and so oh. he did it just because uh, he, he well he did it both because he liked cinema and he thought it was a uh an interesting way to kind of look at things um but he also did it because you know fuck the authorities i guess so good for him yeah um yeah and so but his that was a very short-lived i mean he was only a teacher from 31 to 45 right and then never taught again and a lot of people seem to think that sartre was an academic uh you know and he certainly wasn't yes right and that's that's always a weird view uh, unfortunately it also fosters an opposing view that's ridiculous which we'll get to in a little bit but yeah he wasn't an academic um no he uh you know when he was a teacher he was living in like kind of the lower air like I, I don't want to bring class into it just yet but basically he had assumed that he was going to go on to do professor stuff <clears throat> but at being an academic but he ended up you know going from teaching job to teaching job and he was kind of in the lower end of living in the lower end of paris he hmm was making a lot of money. Um, in fact, in his discussions with uh, Simone, whose last name I can't say because I'm terrible with French. I just say de Beauvoir. But de Beauvoir. Um, I'll, I'll try. I'll try to mimic you and say it that way. I, but I don't know. I'll just teach you bad habits. Um, uh, I'm an American. They always teach us bad habits, don't they? <laughs> um, but uh he would he would talk to her and there was a moment there where he was really um up like kind of upset kind of frantic because he had published i think some short stories which he didn't get a lot of um publicity for um i want to say he was writing some essays at that time for philosophy but basically nothing was really you know he was definitely on the outside and he was doing his best but um yeah he's not an academic though no um thank god honestly but yeah and and after he you know after uh he was a prisoner of war and everything you know he didn't yeah so he didn't return the academy but what he did do was he helped found a journal called modern times yeah or in in french the temps modernes or something right and and um which was named after a charlie chaplin film which is <laughs> yeah, well yeah so yeah there you go that there's the cinema there's the right. cinema um and i was gonna say real quick just a quick tidbit i want to say in, it was like 2016 where the modern times finally closed up oh it yeah was going on forever well, yeah, and it'd be ran. It was ran by some other guy for a while, anyway. Uh, right. I think it became more and more uh, status quo over time, too. Right. But, but I, I just thought that was interesting because I didn't know that. I assumed that it died. Its circulation had died a long time ago. But then I I forgot where I read it. But they're like, oh yeah, it's shutting down. I was like, what? It's still going. <laughs> yeah. It's it's yeah and there's there's so many interesting people that wound up writing for it too mm -hmm. yeah uh, yeah so i mean that project turned out to you know in a lot of ways what i'm inspired by when it comes to sartre is uh what he did with that magazine just um creating and it's not just him there's other people in my life who i feel that same way about <laughs> Uh, but that role of being an editor writer and um, uh, being able to bring so many brilliant people into one publication. Right. Yeah. Especially in the age where publications are split up in very partisan ways, where if you don't write in a certain manner, they kick you out. Right. Or, you know, or you don't 
dot the or you don't you don't tow the editorial line you know and you know it's nice because uh as far as i know which is not too much but modern times seem to have a lot of people who agreed and disagreed with sartre on a variety of different topics yes which is appreciated yeah there's actually a whole book on it uh uh just on modern times that i want to get Oh uh, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know that book exist. The book existed until just now, so I will yeah. go, definitely go look. I'll find I'll find it and link it in the show notes. Yeah, uh, and I'll send you the link too. But. Awesome. Um, well, so yeah, so modern times was a staple of his life, um, and but uh, he also uh, was part of the French Resistance. And uh, Albert Camus created a journal called Combat. Sartre wrote for it a number of times. And uh, he went on a tour of America and wrote for it, wrote a variety of different articles on that. Um, which and, I was, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> oh, well, and then this is, so this is, so you start to see Sartre become more and more of an activist uh, during this time. And, um, you know, he never joined any political party. He was, but he considered himself a fellow traveler of the Communist Party, even though they wouldn't have him. And they actually, uh, uh, Henry Laferve was uh, given the task to basically try to uh, uh, defang Sartre. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. so there's actually a really good essay just specifically about how the PCF went after Sartre that all put in the show notes as well right yeah and um i think that sartre's uh lack of commitment was uh, a a rift between him and his friend paul i want to say nizan nizan okay that's how you say it yeah and uh i think merlo ponty actually had some issues with him eventually over marxism right yeah um, because yeah i was gonna say because on one hand niza and ponty I think represent two different reactions that a lot of people have to Sartre, where uh, Nizan is the reaction of why don't you just completely, you know, dedicate yourself? Yeah, who he was very dogmatic, right? Right, right. It, you know, he went as far as to say like the intelligentsia was the the watchdogs of the the the, the establishment, and um, he. I think I don't. I want to say he wrote. A, a story or something where Sartre is caricature. It has a caricature as a, a brooding, you know, cynical, like bourgeois guy or something like that. I wouldn't be um, surprised. Right. And on the other hand, you have people like Ponty where anything that goes wrong with communism, they're like, Hey, why don't you just reject that, you know, reject Marxism right. and stuff like that. And Sartre's like, mm, those aren't the only two positions, you know, you can try to grapple with both. Which is where I think, you know, the critique of dialectical reason, I think that tension is where that came from. Yeah, well, and then, well, but the PCF actually took it even further than that. They actually were trying to accuse him of being a Nazi collaborator. Yes, right. Yeah, like that. right. Yeah, they, they um, this is one reason that um, a lot of times in America where people are like, oh, if we just had a socialist party, if we just had a communist party that was organized, things would be fine. It's like, well, things might be a little better, but we have to remember that political parties are political parties. First of yeah. All. And so, for example, with Sartre, you know, going after somebody who has criticisms of, of them is I, that's what political parties do. Um, well, if you could imagine, you know, you know how hard it is to go against the political machine in the United States if you're a third party. Imagine if that was a international, yes, communist party where uh, you're not. It's not even in your own country. You're worried about, uh, you know, what Stalin has to say. Right. Exactly. And you know, and, and that's what I respect about Sartre too, is that, you know instead of trying to align himself um like uh, a problem i have with christopher hitchens is he always seems to be trying to align himself he's a trotskyist and he's a socialist with sartre um i feel like sartre instead of trying to align himself he was trying to get a grasp of how things actually were were uh going on in the world he wanted to know you know you know is this what's you know is this 
let me try that again. He's trying to figure out, you know, what's going on, what it actually means, mm-hmm. how to relate to it. Um, and, you know, that's why I think one of the things uh, for critique of dialectical reasons, one, one of the things that I enjoyed is his tendency to see the dialectical as a way of thinking. As a way yeah. Of thinking. And, that's not, and that's not a new part of the way he looks at things either for right. that book. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so anyway, so he never got, he never got too friendly with the communist party because of all that, even right. though he tried. Um, and then, uh, you know, he actually, um, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but he opposed the U S involvement in Vietnam along with Bertrand Russell and yeah, yeah. they organized a tribunal together where they came together and they were discussing, um, uh, it was intended to expose the United States war crimes. And it was known as the Russell Tribunal. Noam Chomsky actually talks about this every now and then. But um, yeah, Sartre was involved in that as well. Right, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say, a lot, yeah, a lot of people don't know that, mostly because I think uh, Russell was a bit of a credit hog. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> Um, and the, the, the Russell tri- uh, tribunal, um, I, I think would not have been what it was without Sartre because, um, I think first off the, the credence that, um, one can give Sartre and that allowed him to kind of approach the Vietnam war in a, in such a way is that he wasn't speaking as a mouthpiece for any particular political ideology. He was there and he was saying, you know, he, he was saying what the Trotsky said, neither Washington nor Moscow, but not, right. in, you know, not in that specific way where he was giving to an ideology. He was, he was coming at it as somebody who was like, listen, this is what's going on. It's imperialism. They're using, you know, weapon, you know, horrible weapons of war against a country that they're technically not at war with, um, you know, and everybody knows about the different arguments, but I, I think he, he gave it, um, I don't want to say he legitimized it. A lot of people use that word nowadays. I wouldn't say that Russell's pretty legitimate, but, um, you could say, take from the existential vocabulary, you could say he made it pretty authentic. Well, he, yeah, he sort of lent his uh, leftist credentials to it. Yes. Um, but, yeah, so between the French resistance and that period, I basically consider his middle period, basically right. until 1968. Yes, right. So between World War II and 1968, and a lot of that he was, uh, you know, back and forth about communism. And that took up a large part of what he was doing and thinking about. Right. Yeah. And, and one could say that he was trying to reconcile existential, existentialism and Marxism. Mm-hmm. I would go as far as to say that maybe he wasn't trying to <clears throat> reconcile them as much as he was trying to. Honestly, I think he was trying to understand Marxism and maybe understand it as a, a form of thinking as opposed to a science, if that makes sense. Because a lot of people treat um, Marxism as a science, as a way of describing that this is how the world works. And I think Sartre was trying to understand it in line with his his uh, philosophical approach, where he's like, okay, well, it makes these assumptions and it works in this way. So what does this actually mean? Like, what does it mean to the individual? Yeah. And he always hated the bourgeoisie. That's oh, another part of it. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. There was a article I read, and I forget the author at the moment, but he said that um, Sartre had four consistent, uh, sorry, consistent um, uh, positions that he always held, regardless of how he expressed them, which was being against militarism, Mm-hmm. Being against discrimination. Yep. Being against, um, God, what's, can't think of the third one right now. Colonialism? Um, yes. 
yeah. against colonialism. And then the fourth one was being against the bourgeoisie and all their values. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And so um, because an itinerary, uh, itinerary of a thought, I think, or itinerary of five, forget exactly how the title goes. He mentioned that the reason he thought 1968 failed um, is that they refused to turn over or, or you know, reevaluate, turn over, get rid of all the bourgeois values. Huh. Yeah, they refused. I've, to. I've never read that. I don't even know what you're referring to, actually. <clears throat> it's a it's a small it's a I want to say it's an interview. Excuse me, I got to adjust this. I think it's an interview. Um, I would have to go check. I, I picked that up, actually. The place I picked it up from was uh, Annie Cohen Soul's uh, biography. Uh, is where I picked that up. Um, because she said it was an itinerary uh, of thought. Huh. Of a thought. And um, he gave that interview later on. I want to say probably early 70s. But it oh. Was okay. I, I, yeah, it was, yeah, it was later on. Um, but... It's a, it's an interesting, you know, take that you know the refusal to give up bourgeois values got in the way. Well, yeah, and it, it just highlights the point of how consistent he was against that. Right. I mean, he taught, you know, even in La uh, yes. he's talking about the bourgeoisie and everything. Yes. So, uh, so, yeah, so that's his middle period, I would say, and then what we're going to be talking about is a work that comes from his late period. And uh, I guess some people might put that at the end of his middle period. I consider it part of his late period. But this is really the stuff that doesn't get a lot of uh, air and in uh, English speaking countries. And there is current academic research being done on this. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but I follow it like a hawk not not quite i don't i don't follow it quite as well yeah i have like google alert set up just so i could <laughs> see when something new yeah. is published and yeah um so there is finally people are starting to come around and get to the late sartre but uh yeah anyway so after 1968 or during 1968 he was uh certainly involved on the side of the students uh unlike the french communist party who were who showed themselves to be counter-revolutionary basically right. uh, uh and, i don't know if you uh heard of the quote but there was a quote from <clears throat> i want to say it's one of the students uh don't quote me on that um but um there was some somebody who said that they that um they being the academics tried to force her uh I never say his name right, Marcu Marcuse. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I know the quote you're talking yeah, about there. Yeah, they tried to force uh, Herbert uh, Marcuse onto the students, but their real teacher was Sartre. Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing that too. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't doubt it. Um, but uh, another thing that happened during that time period is that he helped start a group called the Gauch Proletarian which I think it means, uh, it means the proletarian left. Yes. And this is also when Maoism was starting to gain some traction in France. Mm -hmm. But one of the things about French Maoism is you had two different types. You had one type, which was what we in America would think of as Maoism, which is a more authoritarian sort of uh, communism. But then the type that Sartre and the students were interested in was in they actually thought of it as a libertarian or anti-authoritarian marxism and this is sort of the tendency that the gauche proletarian was uh trying to encapsulate right and um a lot of um um uh, something that is talked about in his biography uh which doesn't technically apply here is Sartre gave his name to a lot of movements because we're all aware of the the famous phrase from Charles de Gaulle, you don't you don't jail Voltaire. Yeah, so I Sartre, think I actually have that quoted in here somewhere. Um, Go on. Yeah, and, and so um, what I what a lot of people don't know is that Sartre took full advantage of that, and he would 
get on editorial boards and stuff like that just to protect different newspapers from uh, being censored and from having people. Um, I don't think it protected from them going to jail per se, but it protected them from being shut down. Yeah, I remember he like some students came to him and they said, we want to do this magazine, but we don't know how we're going to yeah. uh, get away with it without getting arrested. And he said, well, I'll, I'll put my name on it. Right. And I think um, that yeah. actually That's, became Libertary or something like that was the magazine. I, I think the phrase he used is um, use me as you will. Um, because during during the later part of his life, he you know a lot of people don't give him enough credit for shielding leftist newspapers in France. Uh, he did a great deal. Like you know, he was um, you know well known, and sure he didn't do everything he could have. But by the period of time where this is going on, I mean he's he's an old man. Uh, right. There's not a whole lot you can expect from. Him. Well, and he was, and also he was awarded the Nobel Prize and rejected it already yes. by this point in his life. Right, exactly. Yeah, and um, I, I've always appreciated that he rejected it. Um, yeah. He did say later that the only th thing he regretted about rejecting it was not getting the money, and the reason he said that is because he wanted to give that money to different organizations. So it would have sure. been a nice windfall. Of course, so. yeah, and apparently he also. This, this is part of the biography, I guess. He lived really by simple means. He was not... Um, yeah. Yeah, he was not... There was, one, uh, there was one point where he took everything he owned and he got rid of it. Um, yeah. All his books, all his suits, everything. He just got rid of it. And then he moved to... Uh, I think the only expensive part of his life was that he lived in hotels. But... I mean, mm -hmm. if that's the only thing you're spending your budget on and you're making as much money as he was. Man. Well, here's some trivia for you. Yeah. I don't know if you apparently start. Uh, <laughs> uh, did I forget which hallucinogen if it was. Yes. Uh, mes mescaline. Yes. Mescaline. Yeah. yeah. And and then he wound up apparently still having hallucinations because of that uh i think for the rest of his life yeah he he like, hallucinated crabs crabs um, yes uh he he kept hallucinating crabs wherever he went um i will say somebody has contested that story and in the biography that i've read um she said that it didn't happen huh um, okay however that doesn't mean it didn't happen um unfortunately um the, the worst thing about the biography that I read of Sartre, it's a good one, but she tries to be philosophical herself. Oh, and she's God. like, oh, this is a generative, uh, gram a grammatical, uh, grammatical, logical. It's like, stop it. Just, you're telling me about his life. Come on now. Oh, you know, and it definitely deserves mention uh, in here, too, just that. If we're going to talk about hallucinogens, whether he did them or not, or had that happen or not. Oh, he he did he did it. Like I should I should put it this way. Oh, he did the hallucinogens. Oh, like, the permanent that, effects. Yeah, yeah. It's just the the effects. Uh, she seems to reject that he had hallucinations of crabs for the rest of his life. Oh, okay. Yeah. So well, he did I'm... have he did have the hallucinations uh, where he had to go see somebody about them. Well, so on a similar note. Yeah, I mean, the existentialists were not uh, like stuffy academic types at all. They were like partiers. Like <clears throat> I was reading about how there's like some scene. Uh, I think the Beauvoir might have been um, describing where Camus would be like running around banging on pots or something, and like they would just be oh, like yes. singing and constantly drinking and. I was going to say, so there was a description in the biography for Sartre. It was Sartre, uh, de Beauvoir, uh, fuck. Yeah. Simone, um, and Lacan, and uh, uh, what's his name? I want to say Bastille, Bastille, right? Um, Bataille? No, uh, maybe. I don't know. Um, I th I, it's, uh, he's one of the more he i forget his name sorry that's um, all right there were a lot i'll put it this way i'll just cut it this way 
there were a lot of people, intellectuals and otherwise, that met up. And it was after, I want to say it was after the war was over, like a little bit after. Mm -hmm. They all met in a place um, like, I want to say, I I forget whose house it was. Um, But they met in a place, they did a whole bunch of just hallucinogens. They were, you know, drinking a lot. They were having a great time. Um, I think that's where that story of Camus going around banging up uh, pots came from. I, I, I think that's the event where it happened. Um, that, you know, um, apparently Lacan went home with the wrong woman, like didn't sleep with her, but like literally <laughs> went home with the wrong woman and, and then realized the next day, uh, well, I don't want to say she, he didn't sleep with her. I don't know, but it doesn't seem yeah. to be implied, but he went home with the wrong woman and then he was just like, oh shit. And he, and, um, you know, there were, there were, there were painters, artists, there, right. there were a whole bunch of different yeah so yeah, they, they were partying and and right. sartre was known to, for going to the jazz clubs in yeah. Paris, and he'd go to ones that were seedy um and you know yeah and to say the least um and he would go there and he'd drink his apricot cocktails mm-hmm. and he'd have himself a wonderful time and if you think that's being a stuffy academic uh no, I know. I almost think of when I read the descriptions of 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 him and them, it almost sounds like Andy Warhol. Um, yes, I, I mean I hate Andy Warhol, but yes, I get what all you the mean. factory right. scene. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so there's that side of them, and then the other side is that Sartre had his apartment bombed twice. Yes. Yeah, or, he had his he has apartment bombed twice. Um uh unfortunately he didn't have a carl cross uh, uh, a scenario where he got beat up by somebody he criticized but i wouldn't have been surprised i i mean a bomb is pretty close um but uh, um and i'm referring to the austrian uh journalist uh he criticized the author of bambi um so badly that that guy went and beat the shit out of him in the street wow um, okay yeah and he survived he was okay and he went on criticizing the guy even more but yeah. that's a whole that's a story for another day um but yeah no sartre had a lot of people who didn't like him um yeah and, and people understand that because a lot of people will talk about him and you know like you're saying they, they talk about him being an academic or whatever and they act like all he did was sit in cafes it's like listen cafes is how he got his day started yeah, and then he'd go do some other. And thing. Even at the cafes, it was there. Were, it's not oh, like yeah. he was drinking yeah. coffee. All, yeah. Right. Yeah, he wasn't drinking coffee. He was having his his first cocktail of the day. Right. Followed by several more. And then, and, yeah, and in the book that we're about to discuss too, uh, apparently he was on some sort of. Uh, yes, he was on speed. Yeah, he was on speed. Uh, well, I mean, that's probably not the specific one he was on, but speed. Yeah, and fed. Yeah, and um, apparently. Um, it caused him to age significantly, but he kept doing it because it helped him think. Um, and, or so he says, so right. yeah, this, yeah, I was gonna say, if you think that this book is incomprehensible, maybe a little bit <laughs> as he was on drugs, right. but, uh, nevertheless, um, yeah, no, he was fun. Like he's the kind of guy that you'd go hang out with and that was, you know, crazy fucking day right and then there's all the stuff about him being a swinger him and de beauvoir both like you yeah know, there's all she, sorts of stories yeah she she used to as far as i know i don't know if he was bisexual but i know that it, uh simone was yeah i can't and, remember for sure yeah and and she would you know apparently they had sex with each other he and simone until they were 30 but then they stopped oh um, interesting and apparently that it didn't bother him and he didn't think it bo- he didn't he, he didn't believe that it, it bothered her but apparently it bothered her a great deal oh, wow. uh, so people don't know this but simone um and this is just her being human i don't i don't use this against her but she was really possessive of sartre to the point where she didn't mind him sleeping with other women but sartre would he's not like a 
Don Juan just going from one woman. Uh, a lot of times he would um, have, you know, sleep with somebody and then he would develop a relationship. She, you know, she would, you know, whoever it was would spend a lot of time with him. But if they got too close, Simone would get upset and she would basically get that woman to go away, like oh, wow. go do something else. Um, like when he started employing people to write with him or write in, I don't want to say the modern times per se, but you know, he would get people to write. She would just send them elsewhere. She would be like, okay, you're going to be over here now. Or, you know, it's, so, which, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of controlling, but it's kind of, a, you know, it's, it's kind of, a, I don't know, kind of endearing, um, at least, yeah. you know, because, you know, she really liked them. But apparently she did communicate to him that, you know, yeah. So, but anyway. Yeah. So, all right. So just to finish up some of the biographical stuff and by no means has this biographical portion intended to uh, cover Sartre's life comprehensively. Yeah. Or it's it's like, not exhaustive, but it's interesting. But bit. yeah, I just wanted to end with this last part because I think it's directly relevant to what we're going to get into. So in 1975, when asked how he would be, he would like to be remembered, Sartre replied, I would like people to remember nausea, my plays, No Exit, and The Devil and the Good Lord, and then my two philosophical works, more particularly my second one, Critique of Dialectical Reason. Right. So that's part of the reason why we're starting off. Yeah, well, the, we're starting off with critique of dialectical reason. Um, my idea, my reason for it um, was that wanting to talk about dialectical reason is one, it's not talked about a lot. Right. But, but the other one is, is that um, there is, you know, whoever tells you that there's not a direct connection between critique of dialectical reason and being a nothingness has probably read neither because yeah. there is a definite connection it's just it's just an evolution. Um, Sartre tried to claim that there was no connection at first while he was while you know while he was writing, but then he started to realize that you know that, you know it's a whole thing. But um, it, critique of dialectical reason is the most uh, evolved work, I think, for Sartre. Yeah, where, some people would say Flaubert, but oh. oh I yeah. guess. Yeah, there's probably a tie between the between the yeah. yeah because... But Flaubert is four volumes or something like that and yeah. they're all out of print and mm -hmm. yeah, and it's not to knock on him uh necessarily, but like I, I don't I don't usually care for his biographical oh. it's it's yeah. Like Baudelaire. Oh my that's his apparently though, that's like his worst of them. Yeah, he, he did not yeah it, along with existentialism his psychobiographies psycho yeah along with existentialism as a humanism i think he hated uh Baudelaire. I, I think he didn't do he, mm -hmm. he didn't think he did a good job i actually liked it but uh but apparently the jean Genet yeah one is really good i still haven't read it i haven't read it either um, some people say it's their favorite oh yeah it, it pro uh, i the biographer um uh, Annie, she she praises it. She thinks it's really good. Um, I haven't read it yet, um, but yeah. So, but the critique of dialectical reason is definitely a evolved. It's his way of bringing everything together, I think, or trying to, anyway. And a lot of people will dismiss it, and I can't emphasize this enough, but. They're like, oh, it's a critique of Marxism or it's a reconciliation with Marx. It's like, listen, it mentions Marx, but I think it's more focused on Sartre, like Sartre's work. It's a bringing of, you know, everything Sartre's written into a kind of, a, I don't want to say an endpoint because, you know, Sartre, as Sartre says, you know, he was never done, you know, yeah. he's never done with anything. But it was, it, it was definitely a part where he was trying to consolidate all his ideas and bring them together to make them make sense. Um, and well, maybe not make sense, but to kind of give it a more. Like to flesh it out finally. Yes. 
I'm just going to get into it. So I uh, am not the best reader of source material. However, I have read a lot of secondary literature uh, specifically about critique of dialectical reason. Um, and uh, so I'm familiar with a lot of the themes, but uh, I'm going to let you introduce the work. And just to give people an idea of what we're dealing with here, this is the critique of dialectical reason. And this is only volume one. Right. And so this is not, um, uh, it's probably about the same size as being in nothingness in just one volume or just in volume one. So there's a lot of detail in this book and to cover it in just one episode or even two is a pretty big task. However, um, it is something that has been so undercovered in English. Yeah, it's about the same size. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That um, and this and the second volume is the same size too. Right. Yeah. And it, it, so, it took so long, to kill them. Yeah, and then then there's also, so Verso Books is going to be putting out both volumes in one edition, and it'll be interesting to see how they do that, like how big the font size is, and if they're using Bible paper or not, because and this oh. is already not large font. I right. Mean, yeah, pretty much. And I was going to say, um, I forget which of his manuscripts it was, um, but one of his manuscripts was so heavy that um, uh, they, th there was something that you could weigh against it to like figure out how much. Like, <laughs> I, I, I forget how, how the story worked. It, was a, story it worked. became its own unit of measurement. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the, that was the joke. But basically, like, um, you know how it is we have uh, with fruit and stuff, when you weigh it, when you, they had stuff like that in France. And they're like, well, you know, <laughs> you could weigh it against uh, this tome, <laughs> this manuscript. And nine times out of 10, like 40% of Sartre, what Sartre wrote would get cut out because they're like, yeah, this is really long. This is a whole bunch of, so his manuscript, whatever, is probably way bigger than the original the work you know as as it uh, was oh man and then oh yeah and apparently he wrote this with hardly any editing uh when he was writing it uh that's something that his i think hazel barnes mentions that yeah and i think the beauvoir mentions that um so anyway it's a big book and um it's complicated and the language is not straightforward either uh yeah frederick uh jameson who does the foreword in in the book uh he mentions that um you're basically trying to translate whatever you know into a different language which is what makes it so difficult to read right um because basically what he's doing is he's um in my opinion anyway this is kind of just an opinion I think he's trying to take what he talks about in being a nothingness and translate it and translate it into something that is more open to, let's say, sociological, um, uh, sociological study that's beyond the individual. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then also there's in search for a method, mm -hmm. which, oh, yeah. Yeah. In, I guess in French, apparently it was, published as the introduction to critique of dialectical reason. Yeah. Though it was, it was. written at afterwards, I think. Or was I, yeah, I, I, backwards. <clears throat> Part of me wants to say that the it was written before, it might have been written after. I would have to check. I don't remember. Um yeah. but yeah, so yeah, it's those two volumes plus yet another one, which isn't that big. It's like that big. Right, but it, it's actually a very interesting uh, book. Uh, a lot of people, and people should not do this, but a lot of people will say, read Search for a Method instead of Critique of Dialectical Reason. Don't do that. Um, oh, yeah. But but it is a good book, uh, even on its own. It's a good book. But, um, yeah, I, 
I, I think the reason people put it as an introduction is that it's almost introductory. It's almost that it's almost that spot. It's almost like he took all his thoughts he was having right before he wrote critique of dialectical reason and worked them out. But um, yeah. Yeah. So so we got we we talked about how big it is. Um but yeah, we'll give a little bit. Let's just talk a little bit more about the place of critique of dialectical reason in his ove, or and uh, in the um, the place that it has in philosophy at the time in French philosophy. So, Michel Foucault wrote a criticism of critique of dialectical reason where he said it's a 19th century man trying to think the 20th century yep no terrible. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 and uh terrible criticism uh you know i have my issues with Foucault. um but i think i think that the best way to understand the critique of dialectical reasons um place in sartre's work is I would say that um, Sartre begins with the, um, I, I forget which of the essays is first. I want to say it's Transcendence of the Ego, right? It's not the first. Yeah. Technical, technically the first essay. And for me, it's kind of critique of dialectical reason is taking everything that he's observed about individuals. Although I, again, he's not individual centric. But he, a lot of his work is based off of um, the observation of the individual. Um, it's a technique, actually, he refers to him being nothingness as psychic cryptography. We can talk about that later. But he, he takes all of his observations based off individuals and their relationship to the other. And the critique of dialectical reason, I think, rests as his, um, as his place for applying that to the outside world. Now, it's not that he hasn't applied that to the outside world beforehand. Uh, polemics, literary reviews, even his novels technically could be considered that. Right. But this was hit, this was him taking all of that and um, giving it structure. Um, oddly, uh, what's what's kind of odd, what's very interesting about critique of dialectical reason is that uh, Annie Cohen Soul says that Sartre's work tended to be where he would do something philosophical and then he translated it into literature. And I think at this point is where he goes backwards. He goes, eh, I've, I've translated it into literature, polemics, things like that. Let's translate it back into philosophy. Um, and so. I'm trying to avoid calling it an endpoint because technically that'd be against how Sartre saw his work, but it is, it really is kind of a, a culmination yeah. of, of his ideas. And I guess uh, here to be concise, to kind of bring this all down to um, uh, some kind of a generalization here. Um, I think this is the only, uh, this is the one work where he is putting things in order. Uh, most of his work seems to me to be an experiment where he's taking things, different ideas, different events, and he's working through them. Critique of dialectical reason, honestly, to me, seems like a translation of all those things into something sturdy, something uh, analytical and focused. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's kind of where I'd I'd see it. It's uh, oddly enough, it's a synthesis, um, in my opinion, of his different thoughts all together. And then, uh, you know, let's also why why is this book called Critique of Dialectical Reason? I mean, why is it put into into the uh, framework of being a critique of some sort of method? So. Uh, yeah, the, the Kantian, let's say the Kantian style of that, that title. Um, mm -hmm. I think the reason is, is because 
Um, Sartre uses critique and criticism to reveal things. It, it would be his word, reveal. Um, uh, and so the reason he's critiquing it is because, or it's, it's a criticism, is because in order, I, I think in order for him to establish his, his ideas, he realizes that it goes against a lot of different things. Um, for example, um, Jameson notes that uh, his his philosophy almost falls into the category of having sick, uh, being a cyclical hist uh, historical perspective, where he sees uh, philosophy or I'm sorry, history in, in cycles, and okay. so that put that makes him butt up against uh, Marxism or at least vulgar Marxism, where there's the assumption of progress, um, and um, I think the main reason it's called a critique, though, is he's critiquing the dialectical as not being a process, but being a thought, not being a, I'm sorry, not being a material process, but a thought process, a way of understanding things. And so that's kind of why I think he goes about it as a critique, is because he sees this as kind of revealing that the dialectical is a thought, it's a, it's a way of thinking and it and he's going to use that to reveal how to kind of use that to, I would say, use it to come to the conclusions that he does. Hmm. Yeah. And then there's also the other side of that title, which is the dialectical reason part and the whole, the whole beginning of the book is um, dedicated to just explaining why uh, it's even worth writing about. Right. And it's not just because it's Marx, not because of Marxism. Uh, that's not the only reason. Um, what one of the things Sartre talks about in the beginning is that uh, analytic reason is not capable of uh, founding itself. And so it always has to look towards something outside of itself for a foundation. And one of the things he does is that he says basically that I can't prove right here that dialectical reason has this ability except through using dialectical reason right and so what i'm gonna do is i'm going to show you through the use of dialectical reason x y and z how not only can the dialectic can dialectical reason be its own foundation but also how it can uh how it uh actually is the type of reason that's behind human action and also how it is the type of reason of history. Right. And he, he lays out some criteria that if these things are true, then what we're going to be able to show throughout this work is, you know, A, B, and C. And right. that's sort of the way that the book begins is like, we can't, say for sure if the dialectic is worth our time or not right and if yeah it, and it, it kind of goes back to what he states in being a nothingness about individuals where we're always looking for a justification but can't find it mm -hmm. um and part of bad faith is the assumption of a justification that is either something that you know basically it's based on a deception but it's it's the idea that we have a foundation that either um, makes us it's insignificant, transcends us, or one that makes us be something very specific. And so, so when Sartre talks about dialectical reasoning, he goes, well, it can't ground itself, or it doesn't seem like it can ground itself. Right. He's pointing out that the the justification of dialectical reason. It's not in a 
pre-understood ground, an a priori ground, or in God or history. It he's he's showing that through its use is the just is the justification as far as I understand it anyway. Is that if you use it and it makes sense and it's correct, then it's justified itself, which I think he shows is different from analytical reason. Yeah, and exactly. And he's constantly referring to analytic reason in that first part. Uh, he's also performing a critique of analytical reason. Right. And one of the other things that seems to be really important to him uh, about dialectical reason is that analytic reason seems to only be able to deal with what he calls external relations. And it can't deal with the type of internal relations between beings that's necessary to understand human action and history. Right. And uh, what's interesting, <clears throat> so there's two things, in my opinion, when I was reading it, uh, two things I thought of. So the first thing is, is from transcendence of ego to being a nothingness. Sartre discusses how there is no, like, inner self. Like, there's no self that isn't of the self, if that makes sense. Okay. How, however, there is a... Um, I put this. Um, there is a self. Um, I want to. I'm going to just put in my a, words. A presence to self. Yeah, a presence. There it is. There. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a presence to self that we are constantly dealing with, which is the internal aspect. Um, it's not literally internal, but his point is is that the only uh, the, the it's it's a way of helping us uh, connect to the outside world. And so when you bring that over to the critique of dialectical reason and his criticism of analytical um, reason, his main point seems to be for me is that, um, like you're saying, it, it can only deal with external relationships. Right. And, but, but I think he goes further, or maybe it's implied further, where he's saying that basically analytical reason relies on or needs a notion of an outside or everything to be outside an outside force that's driven by something um something and i'm gonna just say it this way uh something beyond so yeah he yeah. Call, he, yeah he calls a dialectical monism uh, at one point I yeah and he has a section critiquing that <clears throat> right and so basically his point is that in dialectic dialectical monism um the only thing that matters is the exterior. Yeah. And unfortunately, what that means is that the exterior is then projected to be, you know, a prime mover, God, metaphysics, uh, history, and right. which is which is how he gets to Marxism, because his point is, is that Marxism, um, or at least vulgar Marxism relies on a abstract notion of history that makes all these external relationships possible. Yes. Yes. And yeah. go ahead. Oh, and yeah, if you want to put this in the terminology of being and nothingness, what you could say is that analytic reason, analytical reason is only dealing with things in themselves or it's only dealing with the in itself. Right. Yeah. It's only yeah, it's only deal with the uh, the being in itself, and basically, um, the reason that he doesn't think that or well the the reason he doesn't think this makes any sense is one, the the, the justification ends up in tautology. It happens because it happens. It happens because it's history. It happens because it's the dialectic. It's God working in mysterious ways. However you want it, you know. There's various arguments to this, and so the analytical. Uh, you know, analytic reason, which, um, small side note, it's interesting because uh, Nietzsche comes at this in a different, in a, in a similar way, but with less rigor. Um, but basically, uh, ana uh, analytical reason, just it, it requires a justification that's a constant. Um, I want to say it's like an infinite digression. It's just. Um, 
ex it's external relationships justifying external relationships justifying external re relationships right so, turtles all the way down yeah turtles all the way down and so he can't you know he point he shows that hey this you know this doesn't justify itself it requires a ground and it can't provide it for itself like you were saying and um which i found immensely interesting because you get a lot of people who are super analytical um or from the analytical school of philosophy right and, and you know they're like well you know these logical uh, presuppositions need to be justified in this way it has to be a sound argument a valid argument and it goes okay but you know and the question ultimately becomes why why is this the case um to the point where somebody might point out hey this is not how the world works it doesn't work in premises and conclusions and um so you know that's you know i i really enjoyed that kind of a that analysis of analytical reason um which i guess leads uh Nope, that's the end of the thought process. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. So, and this was all of this was just us trying to say that's the setup for the book. That, yeah. That's sort of what Sartre sees as important about answering the question of dialectical reason. So right. it goes beyond Marxism, it goes beyond Hegelianism. It really is trying to get at what is so fundamental about dialectical reason right. that it needs to be the type of reasoning used to understand history right. and human action and things like that. Right. It, it's, it's almost, uh, not to throw too many other names in here, but it's almost a Wittgensteinian where Wittgenstein says that uh, when he uh, analyzes language he says that it's uh you know uh what do you say it's it's uh the the use of the word is what defines the meaning of the word and for sartre that's kind of the same with reason and dialectical reason uh over analytical reason has a use and so um yeah but it, it does set the entire stage for this um, right or, I'm sorry, it is the stage that's set for everything else. Yeah, and um, and then, right. So that's this is just what, like in the first 20 pages or something of the book, he's right. just talking about that. And the next thing that he does after that is he says, you know, okay, we're just going to provisionally accept dialectical reasons so that we could go about proving it. Right. But then he says, you know, there's different types of dialectical reason. Yes. And this is kind of like what you were saying with dialectical monism. But yeah, so he starts going into a critique of the various kinds of dialectical reason. Right. Um, I don't remember all of them. Okay, um, this, this is one of the, you know, I didn't get to read a lot of it. So this is why it's so fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, so he, and this is also where a lot of his critique of Stalinism and uh, Friedrich Engels uh, is in this part of the book, because what he's saying is, he's asking where is the dialectic? And uh, he looks at Engels who came up with this idea of the dialectic of nature and uh, which was later adopted by Stalin and uh, included in his package of uh, diamat that the rest of the communists were supposed to take as dogma. Um, he said, he looks at a dialectic of nature and he says, this isn't possible. We don't know enough about science to even go about uh, making the claim that there is a dialectic functioning within nature. And um, then he gives a variety of other reasons why, even if we could, it's probably not. 
Right. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to remember a little bit of this now. Yeah. It, it goes, it goes towards, and this, I don't want to jump too far ahead. This goes towards his regressive, progressive method. That's later. Yes. Yeah. But, um, basically if I understood it correctly, um, his critique is that basically you can't assume the dialectic you have to, I guess the word would be accepted, like, like accepted as a, a process of analysis. Like I'll put it this way. You don't look at the world and go, wow, this is moving in a dialectical way. You right. You assume things move in a dialectical way. Yeah. And then you project it and you see if it works. Um, that that's kind of what I uh, had uh, gotten from it. Yeah. Well, and then the conclusion to it, to this line of questioning of his is that, well, the place that the dialectic really exists is in consciousness. It's in human action. Yes. That's the dialectic. Right. Yeah. Ba basically, you know, it, it kind of, the great thing about Sartre's work, um, to get just a little off top, well, I guess it's not off topic. The great thing about Sartre's work, in my opinion, is that the style of his writing, especially in philosophical work, is, I would say, a spiral. And what I mean by that is he starts at a point, he goes out, he shows you kind of examples, and he kind of explains himself, but then he brings you back to the same point, just in a different spot. Right. Um, which is kind of what he was doing here, where he talked about analytical reason, and then he brings it back. And then he talks about dialectical reason. He brings it back to the same spot. Um, it's uh, I appreciate that he recognizes that the dialectic is not a physical phenomenon. It's it's some it's a form of consciousness. It's a form of action um, that has to be introduced into the world through the agency of the individual. Um, but yeah. So, and that I would say once, so yeah, once he gets to this point of saying, okay, it's not an external dialectic, that's the term, I'm flipping through the book right now, just to oh, oh, terminology. Oh, you're, you're uh, he's saying, and this is all in the introduction. This right. isn't, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is him, you know, setting the stage. Yeah, he, he doesn't, uh, doesn't put this into everything else. Right. And yes, exactly. So. Yeah, he's got, he's critiquing something called, he calls uh, critical dial, critical investigation or the critical dialectic um, and the dialectic of nature, which I mentioned. Right, there's a whole section called the domain of dialectical reason. That's what, what I was getting at. <coughs> Right. And um, yeah, so so that's all just the intro and the lead up. And then he's got a couple more. And I'm not going to do this just for the audience with every part of the book. This is just <laughs> trying to get this out of. The right. Way. Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, yeah. We, we don't we don't have a lesson plan here, guys. No. <laughs> right. Um, it's a it's a discovery discovery channel TV kind of thing. <laughs> um. So, and yeah, there's a couple more sections in that introduction uh, talking about the individual in history. Mm -hmm. And yeah, isn't this where he sets up, uh, where he talks about Marx's uh, claim that uh, um, I, I never remember the exact wording, but the idea that the, the human being is conditioned by history, but he also conditions, like, yeah. like he, he conditions the world, but not, I'm sorry, he, uh, he um, um, acts out in the world, but it's a world not of his choosing or something. Yes. And he had, that's something also that he writes in uh, Search for a Method. Right. Um, now, yeah. Um, now, this might be jumping ahead a little bit, but the uh, thing about this part of the introduction is it, this is the best example of what he later on calls dialectical circular circularity. So that's why I'm going to kind of bring this up now. Yeah, this go is, for this, it. Yeah, this is the clearest example. So dialectical circularity, basically it is is a statement on conditioning. What conditions what? And for Sartre, you know, it, it you know, um, 
it isn't a, oh, I condition the world the way I want it. And it's not a, oh, the world conditions me no matter what I want. He says that it's both. It's a, I, I would call it a conflict of conditioning. And, and here's a good example of that. So when you're born into the world um, and you grow up, you're growing up surrounded by buildings and tools and people and uh, items that have a history beyond you because you're just born. They have a history that, that precedes your uh, consciousness. And uh, the best example of this is a church. The first time you get taken to a church as a kid, you have no idea what the meaning of that church is. You don't know why people are standing around singing songs or listening to this one guy talk about whatever. You have no conception of it. And so as you sit there and you learn about it, you're conditioned by what's going on in the church. You are conditioned to stand up and sing for hymns. You are conditioned to listen to the preacher when he talks, etc. But as you get older, and you start acting out on your, you know, kind of, you know, acting out your own consciousness, your own praxis, you are able to condition that place, maybe not a church, church might not be the best example, but you're able to condition it in the sense that you can make it the way you want it to be. So for example, uh, with the church, um, maybe you go there and you start realizing, eh, these stories don't really make a lot of sense but maybe you start using it as a place to hang out with friends. Like maybe that's what it becomes for you. It becomes a place for socializing. And so that's where you've, you know, taken the conditions of the situation, you've conditioned them in your own way. And so that's why Sartre focuses on that bit from Marx, because what he proves later on is that basically, you know, I might be conditioned um, by, the situation I'm born into, but I'm also able to condition it myself. Um, right. And in, the difference is, is that, um, you know, the difference is, is that my conditioning might fail is the only difference where, where everything that's, uh, you know, where everything that's already been conditioned that appears to you is, you know, um, it can be changed, so to speak but it's already been conditioned where that's the case where it's kind of a, I want to say it's a background scenery, you know, where it's already there. My attempt to condition it could fail. I could try to turn church into a, a place to socialize, but then I get told, you know, maybe, you know, I get asked to help with the preacher or, you know, I get scolded for not paying attention, you know, it, you know, things basically for Sartre, there's kind of an, uh, a possible inertia or inertia god I can't speak today um uh, a possible inertia mm -hmm. when i attempt to condition things and we're gonna get more into that later yeah, too. right so but i just thought that that was the clearest example sort of, of yeah for sure and that that's a pretty good example um and actually the inertia stuff is really gonna play a big role too uh but I think there's a couple of things we want to talk about first. Right, yeah. And um, one of them, I know uh, this is one of the things I've struggled a lot with reading this book is understanding what the fuck he means by totalization. And we know that yeah. he, like he's trying to understand and history <clears throat> a process of totalization. And he's differentiating that from totality. And it's an important thing he's differentiating because it's part of his critique of Hegel. Yes. And where Hegel thought of himself as sitting at the end of history that was already totalized. But the way he uses the word totalization uh, is just, it is like trying to read um math formula yes oh yeah um so here's how i understand it and it might be a simplistic thing i'm sure if we're talking to such a sc uh, scholar i get scolded but for me totalization 
and totality are different in the sense that I think totality is focused on or is based in human consciousness and totalization is the consequence of a variety of different autonomous beings and different objects all coalescing like that's part of it right so the way i see it is kind of like this i the best example i can come up with is um totality is if you're sitting there um digging a hole and your focus on is on digging that hole for whatever reason that is your project that is the total aspect of whatever the hell it is you're doing totalization is the fact that while you're doing that you're kicking up dirt you're technically messing with the environment itself you are doing things that are both intentional and non-intentional uh which is where counter finality or finalities come in but that's later um But basically, the totality is the intentional project uh, that fits your perception of the world. It is specifically kind of where you're at. Um, I would say it's like, I don't want to say it's your field of vision, because that excludes the other senses. But um, it's kind of the field of your intentions, I guess. Um, And totalization would be like... Oh yeah, you're digging a hole, but I don't know. You hit a uh, you hit a pipeline, or you're you know uh, kicking off dirt, and maybe somebody's behind you and you don't see them, and you're throwing dirt in their face. Yeah, and and what makes it so hard to understand that that's what Sartre is talking about is because he uses the word totalization both to talk about what praxis is, that yes. praxis is a totalization. Right. And he's also using it to say that's what history is. Right. That history is a totalization right. that encompasses everybody's totalizations. Right. And, and, and that's what that's what makes it so hard because basically the way I understand it is totalization for him as a word is meant to suggest a sense of perma- uh, permanence. And what I mean by that is... Well, totality is. Totality is like the thing already finished. Well, right. Um, What I mean by total, it's, God, it's so hard. Uh, What I mean by total, uh, total, uh, (laughs) totally, Uh, totally, yes. Um, The uh, totalization, Um, the way I understand it, the way, the reason I say permanence, it's not literally permanence, like, like uh, being resistant to change. What I mean is, it's like all these different totalities are setting up something permanent, right? You're doing something. I'm doing something. That guy over there is doing something. And the totalization is that if you and I are doing these series of projects and then die, totalization is those projects left over. So if you're going to a building and spraying graffiti on it, and I spend my time following you around, cleaning it up, right? Um, your totality is spraying that graffiti. My totality is cleaning it off. But let's say one, one day you die and you're, you've done your last thing of graffiti. I don't know why you died, but you're dead. And I come over and I you know, spray it down. Then the, the totalization of your graffiti is that it got, you got painted over. Yeah. Now, you could also flip that and say, if you're doing graffiti and I'm chasing you around trying to stop you and I die, then you get to keep going, doing graffiti if you want. And I'm, you know, the last thing I did was clean up whatever the last thing you just did. And so it's kind of like a snapshot almost of the end of those projects. The thing, the problem with explaining it this way, and this is already going to get, it's already getting complicated. You're good. That he's also saying like an object is a totality. Right, exactly. Yeah, so, and that, that's the so issue. There's yeah. this thing going on with time and temporality yes. where, like, if you focus, this is what makes it dialectical. Because yes. if you're focused too much on uh, the object right. and you're not thinking about, because the object can both be a totality and part of a, a totalization. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, and, and that's what's so hard about this because he's trying to express 
a fluidity with semi permanent structures. Right. It's, it's like, um, it's like building a building. That could, God, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm I'm becoming too Sartre, and I'm starting, you know, the the totalizing total uh, uh, totalizer or whatever. Yeah, um, uh, the transcendent transcending. Uh, um, yeah. God, uh, but it's like you put, you know, you you build something. Technically, it's permanent, but technically, it's also not permanent. It could be moved at any point. It could be destroyed at any point. Right. But even if you destroy it. It was built at some point. Right. It's a it's, it's a totality that becomes part yeah. of a greater totalization. And so yeah, now that we've worked that out. Yeah. So what so this is it's actually really important to this work because ultimately what he says is that history is a totalization, whereas other dialectical thinkers have thought of history as a totality. Yes. And so right. he's trying to emphasize. Um, yeah, he, he's trying to emphasize. I think that history um, is is fluid but permanent. Where it's you know, if you want to understand a historical event, you have to understand what's going on in that particular context. But you also have to understand that it changes. And and not only it's permanent, but yeah. also it's all encompassing. Right. Yeah, exactly. Whereas be, someone yeah. like Foucault, uh, who's concerned with discontinuities in history and looks at things as a multiplicity of histories, plural, yeah. Sartre is using the term totalization to actually say, no, it is yeah. uh, all encompassing. Right. Yeah. And, and so it, it's, that's the other, that's like the other thing that's so weird with to, totality and total, uh, uh, totalization is that totality can be technically stepped away from. I can be involved in a project, I can stop and I can move on. Totalization, I can't leave that. Um, I can change it. I can change different parts of it. I can, but I can't get out of it. Um, it's kind of, you know, when, when people talk about, oh, you're, um, you know, a product of your, your uh, situation. Technically, Sartre is like, yeah, technically, yes, technically. But it's not because the situation or the historical event or uh, era or whatever you're living in is determining you. It's because you can't get out of it. You can't step away and step into a different, you know, history that would require you know, going into a different reality entirely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, and so, then, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, and then, so this is, once we start talking about this, this totalization versus totality thing, that's when you start getting some of this more familiar language of dialectics involved with negation and negation of, of the negation right. and how that becomes an affirmation. Right. And yeah, and I was going to say, and, and I think that the reason he, that, that to, uh, totalization is so important is because he's trying to point out that you can negate things. Like you can technically negate the cap. Let's say, let's put it in these terms. You could negate the ta uh, capitalist system, right? Like, like, let's just say hypothetically, you, uh, you know, re uh, reorganize the economy, blah, blah, blah. So it's not, co uh, not capitalist. But it doesn't step outside of the history where capitalism led up to that. Right, because it's a greater totalization that's going to basically swallow up yes. your negation. But the thing that makes this a dialectic, I'm and I'm getting excited about this because yes. I'm finally comprehending it. Right. Yeah. Is that he's uh so this actually goes back to being in nothingness as well, where human action is a negation. Um, yes. And so the easiest way that I can think of this is, well, because, you know, if you go this, I don't know who's going to know what I'm talking about when I say this, but Bakunin uh, is famous for saying that even 
the urge for destruction is a creative urge, which is one of his famous dialectical statements. He was also a dialectical thinker. Um, and this is similar to what Sartre's saying in Being in Nothingness, where in order for the thing in itself to become a for itself, so the in itself becomes a for itself when it negates uh, itself. Right. And right. that negation, the negate or whatever, mm -hmm. the, um, the nothingness that is brought into reality through that negation is what makes it possible for an affirmation to happen. Right. Because um, you can't get something new or novel without pushing aside or like displacing what has already been established. Right. Um, the two things I think of for this is the first thing I think of is that statement that existence precedes essence. And the reason I think of that is because his notion of essence is a negation. It's a, um, I, you know, create myself, like, I'll put it this way. A lot of people will make the mistake of thinking that exist existence precedes essence being said, there's no essence that the human being is some kind of weird little empty nothing. But no, what's, yeah. what, yeah, what Sartre is saying is like, look, you could be born with all the things that determinists believe in, instincts, genes, things like that. But for that to mean anything at all, you have to go do something. You have to go act. You have to, you know, just because I have an instinct to, I don't know, um, eat, doesn't mean that, um, you know, I can just, you know, start. Uh, you know, it, it's like, it's not, you're not determined to go eat something specific. Right. You, you and, still have to make a choice. Yeah. And, and like the end point he gets to in being in nothingness with that, yeah. which is like to talk about, you know, like, um, you need the negation in order to, to make a choice and to act and, you know, how that's freedom and everything. The step further he takes in critique of dialectical reason is that uh, what you're negating is a totalization. Yes. And part of a greater totalization, which is history. Yes. And it's introducing that extra dimension into what he was already talking about in being in nothingness as the dialectic of an individual he also so what he's doing now is demonstrating how this is also the dialectic of history right and and that's uh the interesting thing about that so my this is my interpretation and i don't know if people agree or if anybody's ever talked about it but the difference between for me between existentialism and say marxism or hegelianism is i see existentialism as believing in the dialectic but not believing in synthesis and what i mean by that it basically instead of synthesis sartre suggests negation so i act one way the world's another way but my act negates the world to create something different S sort of like well, this is actually also what bakunin right was his oh. critique of hegel was he didn't like the tripartite uh, division. He thought there was only negation and negation of the negation. Right. And and that's what I actually like about Sartre because I I don't I don't care for synthesis. I, I don't think that that's how the world works. And I think Sartre's right, and then and by extension, then that Bakunin's right. That um, you know, one way I describe it to people is this: is um, what's new is not literally new i guess it, it, in in the metaphysical sense where there's some random new thing that pops out of nowhere what sartre believes in uh and as far as i'm concerned and as far as i think is expressed in critique of dialectical reason is the notion of a creative destruction like you're talking about yeah where where i create the new out of whatever's here. Um, so for example, um, if I were to go to America 
and reorganize the economy. I'm not doing, you know, I'm not doing, oh, here's, you know, the American economy. I'm going to do this negation of the American economy. And then there's going to be a new American economy that pops out of it. No, you're taking what the American economy already has. It's the continuation of totalization. And you are negating it and using it to create something else, which, um, which then basically establishes itself as something new. Um, yes. Right. And we'll get into how that is really confounded by other forces. Uh, oh, yeah. Constantly. Yeah. The great thing about Sartre, although people say it's because he's pessimistic, but I, 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 I would say it's him being realistic, is that Sartre, Sartre's theory always has room for failure. And he yeah. points out that failure isn't the end of something or like the negation of something like where it doesn't happen. Failure is where your intentions, and this is counter finality, we'll get to that, I guess, but it's where you intend to do something and you fail, but that causes something else to happen. You know, 1968 isn't without its ripples, you know, yeah. the, the different things that came from it. Um, the other thing about totalization is that basically what Sarch is pointing out is that, um, and he actually points this out in, um, uh, there's a short story. It's not the wall, but it's another military one where there's a group of people who've been captured as POWs and they're being tortured for information. And um, the guy is there and he's, he's uh, contemplating uh, whether he should betray people or not. And he believes that if he holds out just a little bit longer, like the allies will get there or something, something like that. I forget what it's called sounds um, familiar but i don't know yeah right and um but long story short what happens is he gets tortured and he ends up giving up false information and then he gives up actual information and what ends up happening is it's not the allies who show up it's the germans who show up but by that point he's been killed for being tortured but you you see the point where the total the totalization the germans showing up um it kind of it negates but it encompasses the totality of him deciding between betraying and and actually giving up or actually not betraying somebody where it, the the more concise way to put that is that if i do if i do something history catches up and it becomes a part of history regardless and then when people look back on that when they look on your action, they'll go, oh, that's because of this long line of history of whatever, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, well, and then, so they would, yeah, in a different way, they would be doing the regressive part without the progressive part. Right, exactly. And, and that that's kind of his point about reg uh, the regressive method is that, and that's actually his point about analytical reason. Yes, so exactly. analytical, Yeah, ex analytical reason would say, oh, this person gave up information as a part of a longer line of history that, and Sartre would be like, well, no, there was also the, the totality, the internal aspect of the fact that he was deciding between betraying them and not betraying. Them. Yeah. And, and this is, uh, to, yeah. And this is also super, super, super important because what he is, um, arguing against, uh, is so many different versions of determinism yes. that are, they rely on analytic reason uh, and they have, they have, well, the reason they rely on, ugh, I don't know if I want to say it this way, analytic reason only can look like determinism. Right. Yes, e exactly. And, and even if analytical reason makes room for freedom right. uh, or, or free will or anything like that, it ultimately will say, well, you know, you were free to do whatever, but uh, your freedom was conditioned by X. Right. And what Sartre is pointing out, and it's, it's really good, it's a concept I think more people should consider, is um, if you took that story about the person being tortured, if they hold out, it doesn't matter. If they give up, it doesn't matter. And it's not because it, it's not different. It's not that it's not different ethical choices. It's that 
in the end, that's just an endpoint of totalization. And P and, and if you, um, how do I put this? Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. Unfortunately, it's a little bit simple. You can't escape history, so to speak. No. But history only proceeds because you make choices. Yes. It's, it's, it's a weird, it's a, it, it, that's the dialectic that he gets at because, you know, um, those people to kind of go about this in a, a long about way, the people in the story had to decide to join the army and then decide, you know, you know, have, you know, be determined to go on this mission and then decide to, you know, I'm going here or I'm going here. You have to make those decisions, those totalities, those different projects, but totalization which is their failure to do stuff and giving up information as the end point of that, you know, that particular part of the conflict, whenever that is, um, it catches up. And then another, so another way to put this is when you're doing regressive analysis, when you're doing analytic reason, um, there's no room in there for, uh, when, so temporal, uh, the future, right? Yes. And so the progressive part of Sartre's method and is to not only regress and look at all the, the chain of causes, but also to use existential psychoanalysis or, or whatever, just to understand that human beings only act with a goal. Yes. That it is the goal right. that, um, that fills in all of the meaning to make that action make sense. Right, exactly. And so you could do this regression, but then you have to go the other way and start looking at how all of those actions came into uh, confluence in, uh, under the, the, the master sign or whatever you want to call it of the goal. Right. Um, so... I'm going to bring up House here, which makes me happy because it's my favorite show. In fact, I would argue House is a Sartrean show, but that, again, is for another episode, <laughs> another discussion. But okay. um, so there's a point where um, Hazel Barnes talks about Sartre, and she mentions that Sartre argued that there's no such thing as uh, an evil act. And at first when I read that, I thought, eh, what the hell? Like, that didn't make <laughs> sense. But when I was watching House, it finally made sense because in, in House, there's a, a point where he's talking, and I forget who it's to. I think it's Stacy. But he says that uh, she, oh, yeah, it is Stacy because she goes, oh, I was just doing what I thought is right. And he goes, that's the only reason anybody does anything. And so for <clears throat> House, or no, fuck, no, for Sartre, <laughs> for Sartre, <laughs> the totalization of history can be good or evil. It, it not not literally, but like the point is, is like um, there is a definite regressive analysis that can be made. Oh, this was bad or this is good. But the individual who's taking part and is relied upon in those events to bring about events, because if people don't do anything, there's no history. Um, they usually assume have a motive that has nothing to do with the right. the events that are coming about. And where it, you're saying the word motive, just to introduce this terminology again, yeah, he would say totalization. Right, exactly, yes. And and so for the individual, um, you know, um, this is why when people uh, nowadays in discourse talk about like billionaires and stuff and they kind of are like oh they they want to be greedy or whatever it's like actually if you do a progressive a regressive progressive method on this progressively yeah the, they're just accumulating resources but progressively they probably you know like elon musk absolutely fucking deluded but he <laughs> thinks that he's saving mankind and he probably fucking believes that right and you know and, and that's the that's the thing is that you know that's what sarja would notice is that yes that's what he thinks and and the other man so right and then what you can see already is the kernel of his critique of vulgar marxism yes. within this and class reductionism right absolutely so he sartre will make statements like <sighs> uh something about like the napoleonic war 
couldn't have happened without Bonaparte. Right. Uh, or right. what? Yeah, whatever. Getting. I, believe, I believe that's correct. I, I I saw a different version of that in in the notebooks for ethics, but basically he goes into an analysis about um. Um. How do I put this? Any organization can have a leader, but that leader becomes integral to whatever is going on. And it's not because the, the leader is destined or anything. It's because, you know, ultimately in, you know, the regressive analysis, yeah, I mean, there, there would be no, there would be no Bonapartism without Bonaparte because Napoleon Bonaparte, he, it was his vision of how he was trying to do stuff. Now, right. the fact that that turned into tyranny um, is, you know, uh, I guess besides the fact, it's, it's a regressive fact. And so um, this is actually my favorite part of the critique of dialectical reason is this establishment, because, um, you know, it, it, a lot of people think or seem to assume that the totalization, it's a use Sartre's uh, vernacular, the totalization of history is completely dependent upon the totalization of uh, of individual um uh motives the the fact that you know the fact that elon musk believes that he is saving the world mm -hmm. they would they would have to uh they would believe would have to uh, uh translate to some greater good that is done historically in a regret you know in regressive analysis right when in fact what sarch's point is 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 the activity is necessary but the motive, it's kind of irrelevant. It, 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 it's, but, but again, actually, that's not the right word. You're yeah, no, right I word. see what you're saying. And yeah. let me put it this way. It's that when you look at it regressively, you could see why one thing led to the next and yeah. why it was necessary for it to happen that way. But once you, you, you can only understand a little bit of history that way because what you really need to understand is why all the other shit is happening yes and all that other shit is happening because of the progressive totalizing project of the actual free people making choices right where you can't see it in a regressive method right. because all you see is the 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 you know you can't see the future in the regressive method basically right. Uh, that's actually what I was about to say. The the thing with the regressive and the progressive is the only way to see the future is through a progressive mindset. And yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. By the individual taking, you know, the totalization of their, their motives and projecting it into the world. That's why predictions are so weird. And sometimes they're right, but often they're very wrong. It's because it's coming from, from a very specific perspective, but the regressive method can't consider hit the the future at all right um unless it makes the assumption that the uh future will be like the past which is not true and so the regressive method can only look at the past and it can say well this happened and this happened and this happened uh, honestly i think um uh one thing and this is just a personal thing i like that i like about the progress uh, regressive progressive method it allows for the entrance of irony into history. Hmm. So, you know, because you get to see people with these motives and they have these big dreams and these outlandish nonsense. This is why when I write, I focus a lot on people and their nonsense because that nonsense doesn't really trans tra translate into reality except for the fact that it gets them to do things that cause other things. Yeah. And so that's what I, I you know, that's kind of how I personalize Sarge's uh, meth there so yeah and uh just for those watching we're still at the beginning of this book yeah i mean yeah. we we haven't even made a dent in this yet yeah and you know you know when peterson did that stupid video where he's like oh i spent 45 minutes on one line of nietzsche like, yeah you know pick up pick up a book of sartre and you're gonna probably spend about two hours oh yeah no uh, kidding yeah but um, uh so I think we, I, I actually think 
this is probably what one of the most difficult parts of the of his thinking and i think we actually have done a really good job so far of conveying it we'll find out when some people watch this but right um, well yeah we're, we're basically having to explain how he sets the stage the reason the rest of the book is more or less i don't want to say it's fluid but it's kind of a little bit easier is because he set the stage so <clears throat> he gives you the context for the rest of everything that he talks about but yeah no this is the hardest part the introduction the, the beginning is just uh <laughs> it's a lot all right so before we move on to the next one let me just summarize uh sort of with a an example of what we just talked about so sartre is trying to explain in one way why it's so hard to understand history without a dialectical reason without dialectical reasoning and uh to put this in like contemporary american terms um let me put it this way so if you could so if you ask if you take somebody who like they've their project right what they have the way they that have decided that they are going to exist in the world is that they are going to become a ceo and they decide you know or so uh but what happens with their life instead is they wind up becoming a heroin junkie and uh so what so you could use the regressive method and you could look at all of these um causal relationships going backwards from them being a junkie to when they were uh, a kid preparing for exams to get into an Ivy League school. And you could say, uh, this caused that, you know, uh, one thing led to the other. Um, but then you have to wonder, how did they become a junkie? Let's say they had all the right things. They had all the right schooling. They achieved all the right goals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how did they become a heroin junkie? And then, um, what you have to do to understand that is to understand what it was about their project to begin with that already included the possibilities for them to become a junkie right that's what uh in the existential psychoanalysis for sartre that's what he calls the original choice yeah and so the original choice usually like for sartre there isn't really any deterministic aspects of anything but i would argue that the original choice is kind of let's say what what freud would call the libido or carl jung would i i don't know that much about carl jung i despise, yeah, well. I despise him though um but or it's like adler's notion of the inferiority complex yeah it's the central it's the central aspect of uh the individual and how they you know come to be yes it and, makes all of their actions make sense right and so that original choice exists at the cross between the regressive method which for to, to put this in psychoanalytical terms before we continue um that's what the analyst is is reviewing going back through whatever this person's going through from that period to their childhood or whatever but then there's the progressive aspect to that where the um therapist is also having to ask them questions like why do you like this is why asking why do you want to be ceo and what you start to realize is the original choice wasn't oh i want to be a ceo the original choice was let's say in this hypothetical situation oh well my parents really wanted me to be that's like oh okay so so that's wanted to please my father yeah right and so then you can link heroin you know the heroin addiction to failure it's a whole thing yeah but, yeah so it's you know that's why that that's a that, that is kind of a good way to put it actually um, yeah and or, or just like or you could reverse it you could say I, this sounds weird that's why i didn't use it as an example but someone who planned on becoming a heroin junkie winds up becoming a ceo how the fuck does that happen right 
actually that brings me back to house <clears throat> because the the great thing about house you know you're, you're watching this guy who's self-destructive but he's a great doctor and you go how does that work because you would think that one side of that life or the other would have you know c- collapsed the entire thing and yeah if, if you start from the progressive area which some people do uh i mean actually a lot of people in their interactions um have uh, their entire field of let's say totality is progressive is the you know my motives their mo- motives right you know what these people want and it is it's the, the yeah. tendency in popular psychology to right exactly and 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 often there's actually a new thing i find in popular psychology that's bad uh that sartre's uh method allows people allows people to avoid which is they went from saying oh all these things determine what you like and now it seems to be the opposite where like oh you like all these things well that makes you x it determines your future where somebody might have said let's say 20 years ago Oh, the things you've done, you know, determine who you are and who you will be. People nowadays go, oh, well, you know, I don't know. Oh, you, you like this, you like that. Well, that makes you this identity. And this identity is this future. And it's, you know, it's a whole turnaround. But well, let, let me play with that reversal real quick. Yeah. And then we'll get into the next part. So how does the heroin junkie become a CEO? Like if you do the regressive method, You could see clearly, uh, you know, they had an abusive childhood. They they were compensating with uh, pills at first and then blah, 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 blah. And they wound up getting addiction. But it's easy to see regressively how the heroin addiction happened, how they became a junkie. But where the fuck does the CEO thing come from? Yes. And uh, you have to use the progressive method to figure that out because you have to you have to understand what it was about their project that made that possible. Right. And it's, and it's also, um, Sarsha talks about this being a nothingness and I don't want to go too far into this, but <clears throat> Sartre talks about how, um, when, when people categorize desires, they often categorize it in relationship to what's achieved. And he doesn't think that you should do that. So, for example, me wanting to be a CEO um, and not being a CEO, is that the, the failure should not negate the desire. But also the desire to be a CEO for Sartre, um, desires aren't that teleological in his opinion. They are more open. Um uh, well, I guess not more open. What what I mean is like, for example, um, wanting to be the CEO for him would probably be related to what he would call an irreducible desire, which would be um, like we're saying a desire to please. Let's just right. say like, like that's a, you know, it's an irreducible desire. It's something that can apply to many different aspects of their life. And, and the other aspect of that too, is that obviously no child wants to be a CEO. Right. And usually the original choice of being is, you know, happens to chronologically happen at an early phase in life. Right, exactly. And, you know, or uh, it's it's very evident to uh, go back to House here, actually. When House is deducing things from people, often he's not determining, oh, um, you know, you are this because of this or whatever he goes oh you were uh it's like to use a specific example he talks about cameron um and he says that cameron likes damaged people and it defines everything or almost everything she does and that's actually very sartrean because what he's doing is he's not saying uh you know oh you have a desire to something very specific he's saying look this is a uh, the totality of your particular yeah it's like a more generic but also more amorphous right and desire that everything else can be reduced to it right and it can be related to it and and that's why in the show he says people don't change because it's it's still sartrean because often you don't overcome your original choice yeah 
you often find a different way to deal with it. That's why um, when people are, you know, sometimes when I say people don't change, because it's something I believed independently before I launched house. But if I say somebody doesn't change, somebody goes, well, what about, you know, this guy who kicked addiction? It's like, honestly, he probably just, he or she probably just found a different way to indulge that addiction. Or or to indulge whatever was driving that addiction. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> right. So, um, but you know, that's, that's, a that's one thing I really enjoy about Sartre. Yeah. And that's the whole point of the existential psychoanalysis is to uncover what that original choice was. Right. And and then in being in nothingness, Sartre even takes it a bit further because what he says, there's the original project of consciousness, which is to become, become God. Yeah. And then even all of those generic original choices of being can be reduced to that original project. Right. Exactly. It, yeah. Um, yeah. The desire to be God or for or the way it was put in an article I read about an idea for uh, a Sartrean critical theory is that it's the desire to be freely complete and completely free. Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, which is something that Sartre points out, we can't do. It's just, it's, it's impossible. Exactly. And, and a lot of being in nothingness is uh, demonstrating like different attempts to solve that problem, like the whole part on sadomasochism. And right. Exactly. So, so in, in critique of dialectical reason, he's taking he is taking this and he's extending the the way it's applied to also include history. Right. Exactly. And and basically his point with this is to show, hey, listen, people are driven by any number of things. And if you look at it backwards, um, then it's it's all necessary. Right. But but the question becomes um, when you're trying to understand how groups form and how things come to be and how political movements can start and things like that, uh, these motives um, both determine what's going to happen and don't determine what's going to happen, which I, I guess this is where we can bring in counter finality because this is literally what this is about. Well, no, well, let's save that. Actually, let's yeah. save that. Cause okay. I know how to bridge the way. So I wanted to bridge this into to talk about lack and being and nothingness. Oh, okay. And yeah. then to talk about how it gets in. The oh, okay. Okay. The, yeah. In that case then. Yeah. Basically what he ends up showing um, in that case with history is well, that. Hold, well, hold on. So, so in being in nothingness, the original project of consciousness is to become the in itself for itself. Yes. Because you're trying to fill in that lack. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to, yeah. You're trying to, um, yeah, ba basically for him, lack is what drives being. It's, it's a lack of being, drives yeah. being towards being, <laughs> which, God. um, but, um, basically, um, in, the way I understand it and critique of dialectical reason, the way he form reformulates this yes. is through the notion of uh, uh, scarcity, right. um, which is where he begins his, his uh, where he begins after the introduction, he begins with scarcity. And so his point is, is that um, when we relate to the world, we negate the world to, you know, you, uh, we negate the world to be, but that being is lacking. And so we desire things. Yes. And so unfortunately what this does is that puts us into conflict with other people who desire things. And the thing is, is that what we desire is scarce. There's not a whole bunch of everything for everybody all the time. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's like, uh, let's just say food. I mean, yeah. use the simplest example. Right. right. And, and the thing for Sartre is that is scarcity conditions everything else as yeah. far as he's concerned. And so, for example, even if, uh, how do I put this? Let's like, like food, for example, just because there's enough food, let's say for, you know, for this example, it doesn't mean that it it um, 
adheres to everybody's individual projects. Um, for example, to make this like the lowest example, the most uh, concise, um, when, uh, when you start eating stuff, you get a, uh, you, you have a, a taste for certain things and you have a dislike of other things. And so even in what would be a supposed plenitude or let's say a limited, you know, um, collection of resources, people will still have disagreements because certain people don't like certain aspects of what has already been. So the scarcity goes from a mere scarcity of material conditions to also a scarcity that's related to the lack of being. Yes. As, as people are developing who they are and developing their projects. Yeah. And, and similar to the way that in being in nothingness, uh, all of the choices, all the original choices can be reduced back to that fundamental project of consciousness. In Critique of Dialectical Reason, he is showing at a social level how all of our social choices, and this is where the Marxism part of it that he likes comes into it mm -hmm. because Marxism demonstrates how societies are trying to deal with lack and deal with need in the same way that an individual is trying to deal with it in being in nothingness. Right. And what's interesting about Sartre's take showing that scarcity goes throughout everything is what he accounts for is not only that there will be conflict, but he accounts for the fact that that conflict could split up into different things, what I would say different groups. Um, because, you know, some people will look at like a political situation. They're like, oh, why can't they just get along? Why can't they? It's like, because listen, not only are they fighting over resources that are scarce, they're fighting over um, uh, 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 particular parts of that resource that they prefer that are also scarce. And and even uh fighting over like priority right yeah it's like it's it's kind of like if you look at the left now a lot of people talk about well yeah. they don't agree on everything it's like well yeah and it's like and sartre would say well that's because um this is something um i don't know if you got to this part um but there's a scarcity of material and then sartre says there's also a scarcity of ideas which is what I'm talking about with taste buds and stuff with the Okay. You know, no, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. Um, but I I would actually probably just say it's it's a it's a scarcity of uh similar tendencies and how I would but he says oh, scarcity of ideas. Yeah, like there's a yeah, so there's not enough people who agree with you. Right. To exactly. to achieve that yeah. goal. Right, because like for example, if you and I were, I don't know, we we, we you know we were sharing uh, one of those big bags with a bunch of different kinds of chips, you know, yeah, it's entirely possible that not only will our differences make it harder for us to share that because you know maybe you like certain things I don't, but our similarities will also make it hard. Yes, because that similarity uh, causes for more scarcity. You know, if we both like Doritos, you know, we're gonna run out. And then, you know, one of us has to try to establish who's who gets priority near you. And that's actually uh, something I enjoy about critique of dialectical reason. It's just showing that at the root, there's this the scarcity. And it's not just an Adam Smith capitalist kind of right. scarcity. He's showing like, you know, there's more than one type of scarcity going on here. And which creates, um, you know, it creates... Uh, Oddly enough, it creates solidarity that is just riddled with conflict, um, as far as I understand it. Yeah. And then, so then the other dimension of need, uh, I know I'm saying need and you're saying scarcity, but we're talking about sort of the same, same sections of the book. Yeah. Yeah. It's the um, same. But one of the other, uh, um, what did I just say? The other, the other dimensions? aspects of need. Yeah of need is that the reason why it's fundamental uh, to critique a dialectical reason is because it's not, because it also sets up the relationship between the free individual or, and the inert and like yeah. in material reality where 
they both have they're in conflict because the universe basically wants to negate the individual yes and basically annihilate the individual and make it in in itself like the rest of existence right exactly um a good example of this would be like you know just you know this is a good example of uh an understanding of like you know people who go around and give charity or like they hand something out the reason it's a good example is because the inert object let's say you hand them uh, we're going to stick with our theme of chips here Uh, if you hand them a bag of chips that's not going to last forever they're going to eat that and it's in and of itself the inert objects are scarce where it 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 doesn't um, it doesn't carry over. You need more eventually. And Sartre's point is that this is in conflict with the universe at large, where the universe at large, um, at least that's how I understand it. I might be wrong, but is is kind of not built to consider uh, individuals who are constantly in need of things. Well, there's there's that, and then the other. The other part too is that almost like he's saying the chips are also trying to eat you. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> this is this is a. Or that's an, that's an interesting way to think about or, it. Or in a more abstract sense, he says he's saying that materiality is trying to negate the for itself. It's right. trying to negate you, and uh, uh, that's what the conflict is. You're resisting materiality right. swallowing you up just as much as uh swallowing it is required for your own existence right exactly exactly and in uh yeah that's a good way to put it actually because if you think about it this is where in being a nothingness he talks about kind of um and he doesn't put it in these terms but he talks about objects in the the world being indifferent to you mm-hmm. and this is kind of where that gets extended where he goes not only <clears throat> Or, or because basically that indifference for him in, in critique of dialectical reason is more uh, a negation towards you. It, right. You know, it, yeah, it doesn't recognize your existence at all. Um, me having this coffee cup over here, it doesn't recognize my existence. I have to grab it. Well, first off, somebody had to make it. Right. And then I have to fill it with, with content and then I have to use it. I'm constantly having to force this material to work for me. Yes. While it's completely indifferent. Exactly. My, so, we, yeah, we depend on it. Yes. And yeah. Right. And, and it doesn't depend on us in, in a sense, in a sense, it, it might depend on us in a technical sense, like a subjective sense where if I want the coffee cup to be moved from left to right, you know, it, it depends on me to do that, but it, it itself doesn't depend on anything is completely indifferent and um but yeah no the way you put it is actually kind of interesting um, yeah and and it's that it's that thing that Sartre is talking about where you're saying that's what translates up the chain of uh capitalism or whatever is right. the all of this complexity that comes into uh uh the conflict between the inert yes and praxis Right. And this also kind of, in my opinion, makes Sartre anti-utopian, which is, oh, yeah. Yeah, which is a good thing because utopians <clears throat> will basically tell you, um, for example, scarcity itself gets used in utopian um, or I would say idealistic narratives where they go, oh, the reason for scarcity is not that things are scarce. It's that these people over here, you know, for Nazis, it's Jewish people. For some other people, it's just rich people in general. These people are hoarding all this stuff, and if they just gave it to us, everything would be okay. It's right. like it would be like no, it's a it's a start. Except or for like not. a naive critique of the rich instead of a critique of capitalism. Right. Exactly. If if you know, it's like it's like those people who talk about the rich and they go, oh, they have, you know, this many yachts. Uh, we could all have those yachts if they just redistributed it. It's like, well, okay, but what are you going to do with a yacht out in the middle of Wyoming? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Right. Um, but, you know, the the scarcity, uh, the, the, the idealist or utopian take is the idea that there is enough. 
it's not scarcity it's just made up it's a it's a made up scarcity yeah and if we just get along and love each other as brother and sister and share everything things will be fine and sartre would say no scarcity is there fundamentally um yeah. and the idea of a part of a, of a political system is to organize around that let me modify that just a little Go ahead. Go ahead. sartre is saying history we only know his uh, scare we only have history because of scarcity if scarcity is ever solved we won't have history as we know it right okay yeah no that's right yeah that's a better modification um now this isn't to say that sartre doesn't or couldn't <clears throat> hypothetically consider the idea of artificial scarcity it's just that he's pointing out that it's it's no you know it's it's a it's an amendment of actual scarcity yeah and scarcity has basically written our history right exactly and so you know this is why um this is why a lot of times um this is why a lot of times i make fun of uh people uh even on the left is because a lot of people um don't have this particular excuse me understanding um because they might believe saying class struggle right but when you ask them why are the classes struggling <laughs> they'll, they'll go well you know it's because these people have all the resources and if we just got them to, it's like oh, i don't know about that i kind of think that there's more to the struggle than that but you know that's just me cynical and stuff but, yeah it's right and you know marxists anarchists well some anarchists mm -hmm. will because there actually is post-scarcity anarchists which sounds a bit like uh well i guess there's fully automated luxury communists too mm -hmm. so um yeah it's the people who think technology will save the day well I right mean, the luxury whatever thing yeah and and sartre would, would basically say to that look all human history well all of our history let's not say human history because he doesn't pretend like uh yeah he doesn't pretend we're the only people with, or the only creatures with history or anything right yeah so he's saying it's all been written by scarcity it's all all of human activity has taken human activity in this history has taken place within the milieu of scarcity right and I think, like we were talking about with the indifference of objects before and stuff, I think it's something where if we didn't have scarcity, there would be no society. There would be no, um, you know, I don't want to go this far because I don't think Sarsha goes this far, but you, you could technically say there would be no individual, like individ individuation of the individual. But, um, like, like my struggle with scarcity technically has some defining aspect to myself if that makes sense well yeah and if you include being in nothingness stuff in here also there's just a fundamental lack that's never yes. going to be solved so what this brings us to what we've discussed so far is we have to then move into how does human action try to solve the problem of scarcity and we need to talk about incarnation and praxis and the way that the inert uh is used right. and retotalized right and, and then the way that um that produces counter finalities and right. uh the practico inert right so where to begin with that i'm not sure i um, would i would begin actually with the practical inert um okay so my understanding of the practical inert and correct me if i'm wrong because it's been a little but well not really a little bit but is that the practical a uh, practical inert is kind of the conditions that we're born into like the condition let's say the conditions of scarcity um that's kind of what i would consider the the conditions of scarcity we are born into is the practical inert it no so yes and no but i see where where that's going to run into trouble so if we just look at the breakdown of the term practical inert 
Yeah. What he's specifically talking about is anything that's inert, whether it's material or not. It could be ideas. It could be social relations. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, but he's specifically talking about the inert stuff that's a result of past practice. Right. Past practice. Yes. No, you're right. Yeah. Well, well, that's why I said the conditions, uh, the conditions of scarcity. Yeah. Like but, what's come. But uh, the conditions of scarcity don't have to come from the practical inert. They're, that's just. Oh, oh no, 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 no. I, I'm saying the practical inert comes from scarcity. Like scarcity yeah. precedes it. Okay. No, that's my fault. I, I didn't say that correctly. And it's, um, not, it's not just everything that's inert is practical inert. That's the right. other thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The no, practical that, inert is specifically what has been, um, what has resulted from past practice. Right. That, that's what I was about to say. So I was saying from, uh, basically it's the conditions we're born into, but it's, um, it's the stuff that has, or it's the, it's the, I'll put it this way. Um, God, it's, it's the conditions that have preceded us that have been, um, uh, arranged, whatever by the 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 events that have preceded us is that fair yeah so it's kind of like my example with the church where it's something that was there before yes definitely with and, the church. yeah and for, it's all being, in, it's and for all intents and purposes i mean we do exist uh you know our uh field of activity is the practical inert mm -hmm. just because we are already involved in the totalization of history right exactly <clears throat> right and so yeah i guess i just didn't explain that correctly um but it's all good um so basically um yeah the practical inert uh is that it's basically um it's the stuff that's happened before that we end up dealing with as a way of acting in the you know what, you know, this is what's throwing me off is yeah. you're using a passive uh, uh, description when you're talking about it, stuff that has happened. But oh. the emphasis is actually it's stuff that people made happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, it's, no, it's, 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 it's the uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the it's the conditions that have been conditioned. Yes. The people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we now are conditioned by and therefore are also conditioning at the same time. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's the it's the conditions of the conditions of the conditions of the conditions. And it's um, important to emphasize that it's not just material conditions. No, it's not. Um, this is why I brought up the scarcity of ideas earlier. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it, it is also related to ideas. It's related to, um, you know, political principles is related to um, obviously material conditions themselves. It's also related to how we organize those material conditions. There's a there's a lot um, that kind of goes into practical inert. Um, in fact, um, I forget where I read it. It was secondary material. And maybe it's in dialect. It, maybe it's in CDR. But um, somebody said that culture could be described as Yes, to go in there. exactly. Yeah. Right. And that that's, uh, that's specifically why it needs to be emphasized because right. it's so easy to just think of it. Because when you hear the word inert, you think yeah. of material stuff. Right. I mean, and, hell, technically, if you wanted to re relate it to Marxism, it's, it's ideology in a sense. Yes. yes. Ideology is part right. of it as well. Right. Um, Oh yeah. So, right. So the practice, so that is the way to describe the milieu. And then, um, what we would want to address next is the way that human action or praxis is attempting to, uh, deal with need and solve its to temporarily solve its issue of scarcity through the use of the practical inert. Right. So I was going to say, the way I was going to say it is the practical inert invites praxis where, um, 
you know, um, how do I put this? Basically, in order to deal with my lack, I I have to act against against with or in collaboration with the practical inert in order to solve that lack. And how do you lack. how do you act? You incarnate, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, that that's uh, right. And so incarnate is the word that Sartre uses. He actually uses it first in being in nothingness. And then Oh, okay. Can, yeah, he 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 does. He uses it at, um hmm. It's something about turning your arm into a tool or something like that. I think so. Oh yeah, yes, yes, that's what it is. Because he took uh, Heidegger's example of uh, cutting wood, I think, and he he expanded on it. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, it's also the way he describes uh, ownership, where he talks about how, um, like, not not in not in CDR, but in a yeah yeah. Um, he uh because he talks about how basically if i have a hat it's my hat now is it actually a, a material that belongs to me no but i make that that connection and so he calls that incarnation where basically i project how, how do you put it he's like i project a part of my being onto the object yeah and it's kind of like it almost sounds spooky, like kind of demon possession, the way right. that he talks about it. Well, in, in fact, he uses that analysis to explain relics and museums in a very short part where he talks about the the museum from Victor Hugo. I think. And that's in Being in Nothingness? Yeah, yeah, Being in Nothingness. Um, I could probably find the page, but... Yeah. But basically, he talks about... And it's, it's very short. I should put that there it's not like he expounds upon this but he gives it as an example it's a very one of those very short examples but he talks about how the reason we keep say a, a museum or like we preserve the house of a famous person and he said it's because of the human beings belief that those objects that person owned have a piece of have a piece of their being now that's not true it's not literally true but we assume it because it's it's a part of it's a part of the um or i'm sorry it's a version of the way we incarnate things so like me using this mic right now uh if somebody came in and grabbed this mic and took it away i would say hey that's my mic it's not you know there's not an actual connection anybody can use this if they want to but i've incarnated it as something that belongs to me and if I came in tomorrow and it was gone, I'd say it's stolen. And incarnate is also what we do with our own bodies. Right. When, when we use them as tools. Exactly. When we experience our bodies, uh, we're not incarnating them. Uh, like we're feeling pain, but we haven't incarnated our body to like karate chop someone. Right, exactly. And, you know, it's kind of like when, uh, I don't know, it, it, it would be kind of like when you, when you, uh, um, when you're driving, it, this is actually an interesting thing. So Will Self talks about, sorry to keep bringing in other people. Uh, Will Self talks about how when you're driving in a car, you don't um, consider the fact that you're in a car like you're an individual in a car and the car is separate from you and you're driving. Right. You just consider it as you going somewhere. Yeah. It's right. Yeah. You, you collapse, you kind of collapse the different things into, Oh, you know, I am going to X. And so that's kind of what Sarsha is talking about with, uh, with the inert or I'm, eh, sorry, with the incarnation. incarnation. Yeah, yeah. The incarnation, uh, which is done through the practical inert, um, not through with, but, um, Ultimately, the reason that I find this interesting to kind of take it out of the, uh, to apply it from CDR to the real world is that means that whatever culture you're born into, whatever place, the ideology, the way things work, you start your life having to incarnate that. Yes. Even though, uh, like, like, like I, I should put it this way. 
Um, there's a lot of people who will criticize other people and they go, oh, you're just, uh, you've just propagandized, right? You just don't understand. You're so a part of whatever. And it's like, well, so are you. Like, you're, you know, everybody is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Appropriation? Uh, yes. Everybody's appropriated into the, into the place that they're born into. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And uh, in Sartre's terminology, this would be the way that you have to totalize before you can totalize. Right. Before you could retotalize through your praxis. Right. And, you know, and it, it's almost as simple as saying in order to, you know, figure out what's wrong with something, you have to experience it. You have to, well, maybe not experience is a flimsy word, but you have to be a part of it. You know, I, I can't sit here and say that, well, you know, the solution to whatever problem in some other part of the world is X. It's like, no, you, you'd have to go there. You would have to, in Sartre's terms, you'd have to incarnate the practical nerd. Or internalize it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so all of this sounds like, okay, that's all well and good. Like, this is how human action works. You know, we we are born into this field that we instrumentalize through our negation of the real and blah 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 blah. and you you think that this is just some kind of like you know okay you've got this mechanic uh and that's just what's working it out in history but it's not it gets complicated because um part of what we do when we incarnate and when we work with the practico inert is uh or in marxist more marxist terms or hegelian terms when we objectify ourselves we also alienate we yes. also become alienated from what we create right <clears throat> and so it's interesting that he brings this up because um in being a nothingness um alienation is almost a start yeah. Which, which it still is. It still is a critique of dialectical reason, except he phrases it as scarcity. Um, it's not saying scarcity is alienation, but it's pretty close. Um, yep. Yeah. And, yeah. And so when you when you alienate yourself, um, the way you were talking about, um, it's. Uh, how do I put this? I'll say. I'm trying to relate incarnation to the alienation that you're talking about, the thing we just talked about. Because the thing we just talked about is basically the, excuse me, the dialectical circularity that I mentioned before. Yeah, maybe this will help. What I was driving at is that when we objectify ourselves and realize, realize that what we created is alien to us now is alienated that's when we start creating counter finalities oh right okay no i see where you're going with this now okay um because i was going um i was going the phenomenological the being in nothing okay so yeah no that's correct like when we start creating things and creating things doesn't have to mean literally bringing something out of non-existence it would mean something like um part of Sartre's psycho cryptography, for example, is he's, you know, he points out that if you go into somebody else's house, everything's arranged the way they, you know, arrange it. And he says that it leaves a, it leaves a touch of being, um, I think is the word or something like that on everything. Um, and so this, that's a similar thing. I and, remember reading something you wrote about that actually. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so he, he um talks about how or he talks about that but for in critique of di uh, dialectical reason what he points out is that you could make a house with everything arranged the exact way you want and you're immediately alienated well not maybe right. not immediately but like you're alienated because that's you but it you're becomes a finality also. right yeah or, but, sorry a totality right exactly it becomes totality and what happens is all of a sudden you're outside of the totality. Yeah. All of a sudden it's like, oh, well, that's mine, but this is me. And then there's the alienation. The alienation uh, can't really be avoided. And what, 
and as you pointed out, that leads to counter finalities. Right. And, um, you know, for example, a, a, a good example of this is pointing out like, if, um, if you start a, a political party, by the time that political party becomes, you know, something big, something, you know, influential and stuff, you're going to be alienated from it, even if you started it. Yeah, there's a bit of a Frankenstein's monster thing going on. Right, exactly. And what happens is you go, okay, that's mine, but this is me. And then, you know, maybe you start having different opinions from how, you know, how that political party's going. And then, you know, um, another another way to view it is, um, how do I put this? Uh, another way to view counter finalities, I forget who I was reading, who can, oh yeah, it was Jameson in the beginning. He talked about counter finalities as uh, unintended consequences. Yeah. Right. And so that's kind of what counter finality is in well, a very broad sense. And then the other part of it is once you're alienated from, from this, whatever you created, right? Uh, it becomes part of the totalized other totalizations and in a sense takes on a mind of its own right? right and so that's how you get these counter finalities is sort of like you're objectifying yourself uh to try to uh you're turning yourself or whatever into an object to try to like you're basically like a fork so you could eat your food right but once you're done eating the food it's almost like uh, that fork is still going to be there and it's going to be taken up into other uses. Right. And eventually that fork could wind up stabbing you in the neck. Right, exactly. Um, and, you know, in, in political terms, it's almost like, um, it's almost like starting a political party that then eventually gets used, you know, like turned against whatever it is you believed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and it, it could always happen. It could also happen that a political idea or a political party just goes against what you believe, but it just goes in a different direction. It's, you know, um, it almost makes you think of Carl Polanyi's double movement, but I'm not going to bring that up. <laughs> I know you want to. I, I do, but that's a definitely for another day. But yeah, but it's it's very similar to that, though, because in a sense, what happens is I create something and there's a double aspect to it because now I'm alienated and now it doesn't belong to me, but it does belong to me like at the same time. And it can, it can be, to <clears throat> actually, you know what? Here's a good way to put it. My totality <clears throat> can be totalized. Right. And in, in ways that I don't prefer. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so that, that's probably the best way to put it, you know, to use the verbiage. Um, and the thing is, is that for, as far as I'm concerned, for Sartre, that becomes the basis for, um, I don't want to say that's the basis for groups. Is that? Well, a the missing hard? step, and I don't know if we should, we shouldn't cover this now. We should get into it next time. But that missing okay. piece is serial, seriality. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. And um, yeah, yeah, let's save seriality for next time okay. and if honestly you know like i didn't know how long in between these you would want to go um while we're doing critique of dialectical reason but i would be fine doing <coughs> a next portion of this i don't know as early as an, a week or two okay so um, have, yeah so we'll figure that out mm -hmm. and but yeah, seriality, once we jump into that, we're going to be off to the races. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how seriality uh, uh, slipped my mind there. I actually used it in an article recently. Um, but yeah, uh, we should definitely talk about all of that next time because groups are interesting. But I'm glad that we laid the, the framework out first that leads up to his conception because I've, know, I've known some people who have, I don't want to say read it because
because they definitely didn't read it. But they'll read about it, about CDR, and they're like, oh, so he just thinks that groups are in conflict. It's like, well, it's more than that. <clears throat> but yes, you know, sort of. But yeah, yeah, and then there's a whole like dynamic that you start we start getting into when we talk about groups where it's more negation of more kinds of negation that right yeah and it just yeah in, in different <clears throat> sorry different groups serve different functions some groups serve no function um and some are brought together spontaneously i i mean i think all all of them are brought together spontaneously yeah and, well yeah because seriality uh, see, it's so hard to not jump in because seriality is basically like the starting position in, yes. within the practical inert in the milieu of scarcity. Right, exactly. But and then, yeah, but that's yeah, that's for another day. Um, yeah. yeah, I thought we would be able to get into all this like during uh, during this session, and it once you start getting into yeah the bits and pieces of it, it is right. not. I I was going to say, because I thought so too. I thought we were going to be able to get into all of that because I thought, uh, I'm pretty good at condensing things. I can, I can do that. You know, my articles right now that I write are like, they can only be like 1500 words or something. So, and I was like, ah, I could do it. But then like you state one thing and you're like, well, yeah, but he also says this. And you're like, well, yeah, he also says this. And then you realize that it all builds together. It's like a, it's like a monstrosity of Legos just together. Um, I know. So. Well, let's tell our viewers goodbye. And uh, I've judged you all and found you wanting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, we'll figure out when we're going to do this again. Uh, so, yeah. So long, everyone.